Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of our second ICAO NGAP Global Summit here in Shenzhen, China. Thank you very much for yesterday. It was a great day. We all enjoy it, and I hope you have a nice evening here in this beautiful city of Shenzhen. Please remember uh, for the arrangement today, if you want to submit uh, any question to our moderators and speakers, uh, you can do so via slido.com. And uh, to start uh, with full speed, because we have a full day in front of us, I will, uh, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, our second panel of, of speakers that uh, will be moderated by Mr. Arun Mishra, our regional director for Asia and Pacific Office at uh, ICAO. Mr. Mishra, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, uh, this first panel is on employer challenges now in the future. So this is slightly different from the uh, first panel yesterday we had, which was talking about the future, the way fast forward to the future. So uh, we have, we will be dealing with the present and the challenges of the present. So as you heard yesterday, a lot of speakers that uh, air transport has become a catalyst for uh, economic development and many countries have realized the economic benefits as uh, air transport is a vital engine of global socio-economic growth. Also the liberalization and opening up of the uh, air routes, new air routes to enhance connectivity for both domestic and international traffic as well as growth of low cost carriers is giving a big push to this growth of uh, this sector and uh, we are in uh, Asia Pacific region and Asia Pacific is leading this growth uh, as the biggest region now uh, with about 33% of the world's traffic. Uh, we also heard yesterday that the air traffic uh, is expected to double in the next 15 years. Uh, we had a presentation which showed that uh, Boeing and Airbus predict uh, about 70,000 new aircraft in the next 15 years. With this, Asia Pacific alone is expected to get 40% of those aircrafts. Uh, with these new aircrafts, uh, there is a challenge of operating and maintaining these aircrafts. And also associated with that, the challenge of uh, finding airports, the capacity of the airports, the runways, the air traffic uh, systems, uh, the maintenance engineers, the aviation security people. So the whole entire gamut of, we need doubling up of everything. So that's a big challenge. And uh, simply stated, uh, the demand far outstrips the availability of the supply. And uh, some of the reasons uh, for this is that there will be a wholesale, wholesale retirement in current generation of aviation professionals. Aviation profession is at present not attractive enough to potential candidates. Competition with other industry sectors for skilled employees. Training capacity is insufficient to meet demand. Learning methodologies not responsive uh, to the new evolving learning style. Accessibility to affordable training. Lack of harmonization of competencies in some aviation disciplines. And little awareness by the next generation of types of aviation professions available. So with this, we have a very distinguished panel with us. <coughs> So from diverse fields, so we have um, Mr. Nimal Sari, who is the Director General of Civil Aviation from Sri Lanka. We have Patti Chow, who is the Regional Director of uh, Airport Council International for Asia Pacific Region. We have Mr. Sai Narayan, who is the Chief of Aviation Data and Analysis Section of ICAO. We have Ian Rainier, Head of Training and Licensing of IATA. We have Tobon Vishal, Global Leader for Training Strategy for Civil Aviation from CAE. And we have Yan Hua Tang, Deputy Director of Human Resource Department, Commercial Airport Aircraft Corporation of China Limited. <clears throat> so what uh, my plan for this panel discussion is that 
we will have a brief uh, presentation by each of the panelists and then we will follow it up with a few questions from my side as well as from the audience. So with further first, I would like to invite Mr. Sainarayan from IKO to give his brief. Um, I would like to refer to Sainarayan, I mean in a lighter vein, as a prophet of doom. So he's going to tell us about all the numbers and the scary picture. Thank you, Mr. Mishra. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure being here in Shenzhen. Uh, so my presentation today is about uh, looking at the future, what uh, the future portends in terms of uh, requirements of personal. Uh, so I call, we have been doing forecasting work. It's mandated by the council and the assembly. So we have been working with a multidisciplinary working group on long-term traffic forecasts. This comprises of major states, uh, which includes United States, China, India, and a lot of other big countries. Uh, we have been working together to build robust models uh, from which uh, we can uh, predict the future traffic growth. Uh, so we have uh, extended this work on traffic forecasts uh, to fleet forecasts and then to personal forecasts. And I will explain how we have done that. So uh, uh, we, we were mandated, as I mentioned, by the assembly to, uh, to use uh, uh, the modeling expertise uh, from the member states. And uh, working with them, we have published the model as well as the, the forecast at the level of country pairs and at the level of root groups. So we have the number of uh, uh, the traffic in terms of departures and uh, passengers, RPKs and ASKs at the level of country pair level. Uh, we have also done a survey where we have asked the states to report uh, their fleet as well as the training capacity which is present, as well as the training capacity which the states expect to be after 20 years from now. So that has gone into the model and that has been extended uh, to the fleet forecast work as well as to the personal forecast work. And this is the results of this which have been displayed for the first time here. So uh, for, uh, the, for the global level, uh, based on the people who are actually flying the planes uh, in terms of pilots, uh, the actual flight crew, these are the people who are actually flying today. Uh, use, that means the aircraft which is being used for schedule operations and non-schedule operations uh, for 100 seaters or more. This is that. It's not the people who are licensed, but people who are actually you know, um, flying the schedule and non-schedule op operations. So uh, in 2017, we say that uh, it's 360,000. And as you see, uh, this is both international and domestic routes. And we expect uh, this to grow uh, to around 720,000 total requirements uh, in 2037. And of which, uh, taken a 3% attrition rate, uh, we see that uh, uh, there will be a demand for around 554,000 commercial pilots uh, 20 years from now. And on the bottom half of this, the left-hand side of this, you can see the bar, and you see that uh, there's a quantum jump in terms of uh, requirements for Asia Pacific, which is increasing from 31% to 41%. And you can see for the other regions uh, how it's growing 20 years from now. Uh, this is just a map, a pictorial description on the map. Uh, the maximum demand uh, is 98,005 approximately, which is uh, extended with the, the dark green bar and the country which is associated to, and the lighter shades requires lesser requirements for new commercial pilots in 2037. So these are the world rankings. Uh, uh, as you see today, uh, United States is number one, uh, uh, number two is China and the like. Uh, but do you see the ranks which will be there in 2037? Uh, we expect China to be number one in terms of uh, the demand for new pilots, uh, followed by United States, India, United Kingdom and the like. Now, we did the same exercise for air traffic controllers too, and uh, 
uh, in 2017 uh, from 85,000 uh, air traffic controllers which are basically controlling this schedule and non-schedule operations of 100 seats or more, uh, it's expected to jump to 161,000 uh, with uh, requirement of almost 106,800 uh, new controllers. And again, you see the, on the left-hand side uh, uh, that most of this increase is coming from Asia Pacific, uh, followed by uh, um, Europe and uh, others. Uh, with a 2% attrition rate, which has been taken from the forms which have been reported to us by member states, uh, we expect the demand for new controllers uh, to be 106,000 out of the total demand of 161,000. Again, this is the ranking for air traffic controllers uh, by state, and as you see, again, uh, uh, there's going to be some shifts. Uh, most of it is going to Asia Pacific, uh, with China being number one, and again, uh, followed by India, number three, and the likes. We have again done the same work for maintenance technicians and cabin crew, uh, demand forecasts. Uh, so for maintenance technicians, again, uh, uh, with a 3% attrition rate, uh, the, the requirements for maintenance technicians will be 443,000. Today is going up to 869,000, uh, with the new uh, predicted to be around 670,000 uh, new maintenance engineers and technicians. Uh, Again, with the 3% attrition rate, uh, 666,000 would be new, as I mentioned. For cabin crew, uh, there will be a real re a big requirement for, in terms of total numbers, is almost 1.1 million cabin crew would be required. And again, with the 3% attrition rate, uh, it will be close to a million new, uh, 920,000 uh, new uh, cabin crew forecasted uh, in 2037. Uh, we have done extended this uh, again for each state. We are showing the the number of uh, uh, the countries which will be top five. Pardon the typo for South Africa. You couldn't fit it in there. But uh, in Africa, the top five countries in requirements of total personnel, all of these put together, as you see, pilots, controllers, technicians, and cabin crew would be in this order. South Africa followed by Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Morocco. Uh, for Asia Pacific, as we already sort of indicated, it will be China, India, Australia, Japan, Indonesia. Uh, for uh, Europe, it will be UK, France, Germany, Spain, Turkey. Uh, and uh, for Latin America, the same, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, and Colombia. And for Middle East, it will be UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Iran, and Israel. Uh, for North America, even though we say top five, it's the, just two countries, U.S. and Canada. Uh, so coming back to the world, the top five countries uh, which will be driving the demand for total new personnel would be China, U.S., India, U.K., and U.A.E. And you see on the left-hand side uh, the bar showing how much is the current and how much would be the requirement for new personnel. The other interesting thing which we did, as I mentioned, was we asked the states to tell us how much is the current training capacity and what is their prediction for the future training capacity, where they see that. Uh, our, our looking at the form and doing an analysis, we see that currently the utilization stands somewhere from 75 to 80 percent. That means 80 percent of the existing capacity is actually being utilized. Uh, that's what the reporting shows. And as you see, we are just given some of the big countries here. And uh, you see that uh, for pilots, it's almost neck to neck that we expect training capacity to keep pace or slightly be higher than the requirement. But that's not the case, it appears, for air traffic controllers. Now, we have to still, we are looking at the reasons why. Is it because of the fact that they expect technology to catch up to the extent where this much of training capacity is not essential? That is something which we are still looking at. Uh, finally, uh, our focus is not taken into account uh, as uh, the first day panelists were speaking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, remote aircrafts and uh, pilotless aircrafts. Uh, we expect that in 20 years from now, maybe uh, considering the state of investment which is already gone into this new aircraft, around 150, 200 million already been spent on these aircrafts, and having a life cycle of 20 years, that technology will continue, and the demand for existing pilots' training capacity should be there. But at the same time, we expect that for this pilotless aircraft, it could start off as a ride-sharing uh, where it's completely autonomous, or it could be for transferring cargo or e-commerce, and that's where we expect 
uh, additional training capacity to be needed, which has obviously not been considered by us in our forecast. So in conclusion, I would say that Asia Pacific will lead the growth for new fleet and personnel. Uh, there is a gap, as you see, between the requirement and the training capacity. And obviously, there's a need to invest in new training capacity and or utilize uh, available surplus capacity in more mature markets where demand is slowing but uh, training capacity exists or allow for mobility of uh, personnel from more mature markets to emerging markets. This could be another way out. Uh, finally, obviously, there is requirement for uh, planned policy interventions. And uh, I would like to say the states are invited to use the ICOP personal forecast, which will be made available through the appropriate ICOP panels. Uh, but uh, if they want to start taking a look at it, they have to just uh, log into that uh, uh, link which has been given and or contact uh, the officer which has been given here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sai, for a very comprehensive overview of the shortages and the demand which we are going to face in the next couple of years. Uh, I would now invite Patti Chow, uh, Regional Director ACI, to share her perspective on this issue. Good morning, everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you, Akeo, for inviting ACI to this prestigious event. Um, it is an honor to be here. Um, yesterday, uh, you've heard that um, Dr. Liu Fang mentioned that aviation supports 65.5 million jobs and generates 3.6% of global GDP with its $2.7 trillion uh, economic impact. So aviation is a vital engine of global interconnected economy. So my presentation today, uh, first we'll look at the forecast. Um, ACI forecasts that air service demand will double in the next uh, 15 to 20 years, and much of this growth is coming from uh, emerging markets, and these include China, Indonesia, India, Malaysia, and Vietnam, which are among the 10 uh, top fastest growing um, emerging markets in the world. And it is, it is expected to account for over 60% of uh, world passenger traffic by 2040. So this anticipated growth, of course, offers tremendous opportunities, but at the same time put a huge strain on uh, infrastructure, investment, on regulation, and ultimately on human capital. Because where are we going to get the airports and airline professionals, um, the leaders, and as we've heard, we, we need over 500,000 pilots by 2037, and the flight attendants, the MRO, the MRO technicians, and so forth. So human capacity is a, a critical um, stage in Asia Pacific and it's very timely that we uh, recognize and we continue to uh, debate. Now, working at an airport is uh, generally not perceived as a first choice of employment, so uh, we need to change that perception. Um, a lot of airports are um, increasing or creating employer branding and uh, we've seen examples where uh, big hubs like Changi Airport, uh, Incheon, uh, Hong Kong, they're doing a fantastic job in attracting a new, new talents by um, increasing their employer branding. And certain things like increasing awareness of the airport and aviation community in young children, um, you can start as young as kindergarten and elementary school. Um, increase awareness in internships with universities and technical uh, schools and have these schools work together with the industry, uh, for example with uh, KO or with ACI, to identify uh, new and growth areas. And the second challenge that we face in, um, in aviation or in airport uh, in general is that we don't track enough women in the industry. And looking at this room here, uh, we still have a lot of room to, to improve. Now we cannot ignore um, half the world's population as we continue to compete with other industry for, for talent. Uh, we seem to take two steps forward and one and a half step back. 
Uh, for example, in Asia Pacific, we had two senior, uh, we had two CEOs in uh, large airports, and that's Sydney and, and Brisbane, um, and they retire within months of each other uh, this year, so we're down to almost none. And the same thing in Europe, uh, we had uh, one or two CEOs, but um, they also retire, resigned, and we're down to almost none. Um, the only positive spot is in North America. There's still a depth of a bench of women uh, in, in currently in CEO positions or uh, competing for uh, senior roles. But unfortunately, this trend is not favorable to, to women because there is a tendency to uh, for airport companies to recruit um, outside the industry um, for corporate talents to fill these vacancies. And we hear a lot about um, attract and retain uh, talents yesterday, um, but I think we need to do a lot more than that. And what the airport have been doing um, recently is that, you know, we talk about uh, work and, and life balance, and so how do we make that work for the millennials? Um, so some of the airports have uh, established um, gyms inside the airport. They have nurseries now for young families. So these is some of the ways that are, we're retaining our staff. And, but we can do a lot more, and obviously coaching and inspiring the young aviation professional um, goes a long way. Uh, for example, I had two very good mentors um, during my career, and um, they've made a very positive impact in my career throughout the 19 years I've been in aviation. Um, so let's coach and inspire your team, and of course that goes a long way. So those, three, those are some of the challenges that our airports are facing at this moment. And um, in terms of what ACI is doing, we have a number of programs to address and, and uh, these shortages and help our airport members um, for the future. And one of them is the ACI Executive Leadership Exchange Program. Uh, this program develops airport management for senior level responsibilities by twinning them with uh, colleagues from another airport. Um, so recently we've just ha paired two airports together and that's C Cincinnati Airport from the US and also Changi Airport. So these two airports, um, their senior staff went to each other's um, role and they learn each other's best practices and learn from um, the airport, uh, their management style. And the second program that we have in place is called the Mentorship Program, and the goal of this is to match up-and-coming executives to current and recently, um, with recently retired CEOs. So there's currently a few pairs taking place right now, and we're looking um, at seeing how that um, outcome plays out. We also have uh, global training. It's it's uh, your go-to place for airport management and operations education. It offers executive leadership, uh, professional accreditation, subject matter competency, and in-house training, and of course, online training as well. And we're very pleased to um, cooperate and partner with ICAO to develop a few of these courses. And lastly, we have scholarships and assistances. Um, ACI provides um, a scholarship to um, Iowa, the International Aviation Women's Association, an annual scholarship um, to their members as a development program. And at the regional level, we have a program, what we call the Young Executive of the Year Award uh, since 2009, and ICAO is a, is a judge on, on that panel. And basically, we put out a topic that is um, relevant to the industry. We ask these individuals to write a, a paper and identify and uh, suggest innovative idea to uh, solve this challenge. And the best solution that comes out will be deemed the, the Young Executive of the Year. And for the developing nations, um, and in support of ICAO's No Country Left Behind, um, ACI provides free training workshops um, and courses to developing nations, and is subsidized through our development, uh, developing nations assistance and ACI fund programs. So those are some of the things that ACI is doing to assist our airports um, to prepare for the future. And, and I think my time is up, and if there's any questions, I'm pleased to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, for sharing the ACI's various initiatives to deal with this problem. Our next speaker is Mr. Jan Renier, Head, and train, Head of Training and Licensing of IATA. professionals, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. 
Before uh, elaborating about the aviation skill shortage, I would like to say a few words about IATA. Uh, IATA is an airline association. We have 290 members in total. In Asia uh, Pacific region, we have 80 members. And in China, we have almost uh, 40 members. I take the opportunity to be on this panel in China to congratulate uh, three uh, airlines who joined IATA this year. Ebay Airlines, Unier, and uh, Fuzhou uh, Airlines. From uh, yesterday, we have uh, understood that the um, number of passengers is supposed to double by uh, the next um, 20 years. Those figures are typical uh, IATA forecast we deliver each year. So from my organization perspective, we have a big concern about any capacity limitations and the sustainability of the system. Concerning the aviation skill shortage, we do not provide a specific uh, sh uh, forecast in this domain, but uh, I have been tasked by my organization to investigate in this area. Aviation skill shortage for us means pilot, maintenance, air traffic controller, and we are investigating as well in the impact of uh, the technology for the potential uh, job characteristic changes. So what we have done, first step to collect information through a specific survey. We have completed uh, the pilot survey and the maintenance survey uh, last week. So today I will be able to deliver only some raw data about the pilot survey. And the detailed survey report will be available mid of January next year. The second step will be to propose to our members mitigation measures in order to support our members to cope with the challenges of the aviation skill shortage. So, in terms of uh, raw results, 71% of our members are facing today or forecasting a shortage. Compared to the shortage you have seen previously, who are always targeting 20 years or maybe for CAE uh, 10 years, we have asked questions about something more tactical, the next three years and the next six years. So IQ asked me, one, Jan, where are the hot spots? According to the result I have in hands today, the hot spots for us are Africa and the region of Asia. 77% of our members, they have already some strategies in place. Top three strategies, recruitment campaigns, awareness at university level, and financial incentives. So to the question from IKO, does this, uh, those strategies work? Yes, those strategies work. Is it enough? No. Because in Asia, uh, this region has implemented, or the operators from this region, they have implemented the top three strategies, and they are still in a situation of shortage. From our member perspective, the cost of the training is a key issue to attract a initio. It's a problematic. It's difficult today to attract and to retain professionals. This is just confirmations of the actual uh, situation. Our members request harmonizing the selection process. Our members declare they have a problematic with the training capacity. And for all of us, the problematic number one is a lack of qualified instructors. 40% of our members declare there is a gap between licensing standards and the operator standards. And there is a clear need for a regulatory harmonization. So, to be macroscopic and big picture on the pilot side, this is the situation who happens too often today. The applicant, he or she, goes through an initial training to get a commercial pilot license. During this training, mainly the technical skills 
how to fly the aircraft, how to use automation, how to apply SOPs, are trained and assessed. This is the traditional prescriptive training focusing on tasks and based on an, an amount of hours. Afterward, those persons go through a selection process. And in the worst case scenario, 70% of them ex uh, encounter a failure. 70% of them encounter a failure. Because of what? Because on the operator side, beyond the technical skills, we are already speaking about competencies. Competencies are key elements in terms of safety. Competency communication, competency situational awareness, competency workload management, competency leadership teamwork, and competency problem solving and decision making. So this is the reason why we are far beyond and there is a gap between the licensing training, task-based, and the operations and the operator criteria who are competency-based. Just imagine the frustration for the applicant who has spent a lot of money during initial training and he has difficulties or he is not able to join an operator to uh, get a job and to be able to reimburse the loan for the self-sponsored uh, applicants. So what we are doing today, working on uh, today, is first to attract. So the industry, and NAYATA in particular, has it, its role to play in this situation. But for me, NGAP is the place to coordinate our efforts with the governments, of course, the states, and the regulators as well, as well, to find solutions to attract the competent people we need for our industry. Selection process up front. We have now, in the best case scenario, a proper selection process, guarantee success up to 98% during initial training and success in operation, becoming commander, instructor, management pilot, etc. So I am obviously a little bit raw comparing the previous situation to this one, but in the best case, 98% of success after a proper selection. Initial training, it is done within an approved training organization or a flight training organization. And you see the initial training now is close to the operator. We are sure and we are working on it that the engagement of the operator with the initial training is a key of success. And we are already working on this topic with uh, Top John as an example, with major training organizations, in order to identify the key elements who are needed to ensure success at the initial training level. The gray arrow is representing, in fact, the line of the competency. For us, traditional training, our base, task base, is totally from the past. We are pushing, promoting, and supporting competency-based training and assessment in general. This is true for the pilot stream, of course, but competency-based training and assessment is applicable for all aviation disciplines. So we are promoting this. Uh, what IATA is doing in general, we deliver plenty of guidance in order to uh, support our members in particular, but the industry in general, to implement new uh, training methodologies such as uh, competency-based training and assessment. So we are about to deliver uh, an updated pilot aptitude testing, which uh, corresponds to the answer of the selection process. And we are also working with IKO to deliver a guidance to implement suitably competency-based training and assessment. Additionally, um, I got uh, the approval from our DG in IATA, Alexandre de Gignac. Um, for us, CBTA, competency-based training and assessment, is a strategic goal and is part of our mitigation measure in regards of the shortage in all aviation disciplines. So I got a specific budget to support organization to put in place competency-based training and assessment. So I think I am at the end of my presentation. I thank you for listening and um, I hope to uh, have uh, more and more candidates in our industry. Thank you.
thank you Yan. Uh, one of the points which I really liked about his presentation was regarding harmonization. So we need to have harmonization of selection process, harmonization of regulatory standards between various states, and also harmonization of operational and uh, regulatory licensing requirements. So with this, uh, I would now invite uh, Mr. Torbon Wisher. Uh, he's a global leader from CAE, uh, which is a major uh, training solutions provider to the world. So uh, I would like to start with thanking the organizer for uh, letting me be here and present on behalf of CE at this very important and prestigious uh, event. So my presentation today will have two parts. Uh, the first part I will touch on or I will give data and background on the global demand for professional pilots. And it's based on CA's 10 years pilot demand forecast that was released a year and a half ago. And this year we have updated it with the, with the data for the business aviation pilots as well. And then I will very briefly touch on two of the initiatives that CA is taking to mitigate this unprecedented situation with regard to the pilot demand. So let's start at looking at the market driver that underpins the pilot demand. And if you compare the business aviation side with the commercial aviation side, uh, it's been two complete different realities and it's been completely different for the last couple of years. Uh, starting with the business aviation side, uh, that market almost imploded in uh, 2012. And the aircrafts delivered went down from record high and down to uh, a flat around 700 aircraft a year since 2012. We can see signs of improvement this year. Um, utilization is the measurement of, of growth in the business aviation market and uh, there is a improvement from flat 2% to percent the, the last uh, couple of years to 4% this year. Then the second key performance indicator is the number of aircrafts for sale. And uh, it has been a reduction there and we expect the number of aircraft for sales to flatten out around 9% of the active fleet. And then there are other positive signs. There are a couple of new aircrafts that will enter the market and they all represent the large cabin segment. Uh, it's the Global 7500 and the Gulfstream are releasing the 5 and 600. And then we have the so with the Falcon 6X. So signs of improvement, um, but not like the commercial aviation market, which is all time high, a complete different reality. We uh, see that the traffic is uh, rising. We have an improvement of 7% year over year, and I think this is the third year in a row that we reality outperforms the, the uh, prediction from Yata. City pair connections. Uh, uh, wherever you go in the world to big airports, you can see that the new destination has opened up. And we are now have over 20,000 city pairs connected on a global basis. And uh, with this growth, we uh, have from a very high number improved even further with regard to the cabin load factor. I think it's one more percent this year from 80 to 81 percent on an average global basis, which is staggering. Um, and just to mention, the, the reason why I have both the business aviation and the commercial aviation in this forecast together is that it's basically the same pool of pilots. Uh, there's movement in between and you can't really separate them, so they belong together. So the calculation have basically four factors. It's a very simple calculation. We first look at the need for replacement and uh, Replacement is based on retirement from the industry and then of course mainly age-based retirement and then movements within the industry. 
in combination with the, the active number of aircraft types and the crew ratio per aircraft types, and that all rolls up to the demand for pilots. Let me start looking at the demand for uh, to cover up for uh, people leaving the industry and the movements within the industry. Looking at the business aviation side first, uh, the retirement will be around 4% of the active pilot corp uh, per year. That's around 2,000 pilots. And then 2,000 pilots will leave that part of the business to move into commercial aviation. So grand total, 4,000 pilots a year. Over 10 years, that's 40,000 pilots. And then if we compare that with the active 55,000 pilots in business aviation, you basically see that the entire pilot corps will be changed out over 10 years. Looking at the commercial side, uh, we have 110,000 pilots that believe the industry uh, the coming 10 years. And 110,000 pilots, uh, only 70,000 of those will leave due to age-based retirement. Uh, the other 40,000 pilots, they will leave for uh, medical reasons, they will seek other opportunities outside this industry, uh, and so on. So uh, that's quite a high number uh, in comparison to the age-based retirement. Looking at the average age, the, the two highlights here, uh, the commercial airline pilots uh, is an aging group of individuals with the average age of 46 years. On the business side, it's, it's even higher, it's 49 years, and that of course uh, will trigger some, some, uh, some turnover. And then looking at the active fleet, uh, on the business side, we will add another 5,000 uh, aircrafts, uh, going from 22,000 to 27,000 aircrafts uh, over 10 years. Their um, number of pilots per aircraft in business aviation is quite low, it's just about two pilots per aircraft. It's increasing a little bit, I think the average will be 2.3 pilot, and uh, it's mainly based on, on the high utilization. On the commercial side, uh, we uh, are adding another 12,000 aircraft to the fleet. Uh, it will trigger another 160,000 pilots uh, to just cover up for that uh, number of aircrafts. With the crew ratio, I think it's around 12.5 pilots per aircraft, also triggered by high utilization. And then um, proportionally, there is a high number of wide body aircraft, which uh, has a tendency to have more pilots per aircraft. So, on consolidated basis, what does this mean? Uh, it means that we will, in 10 years, uh, need 530,000 pilots. And we need to add another 300,000 pilots to the market to reach those figures. Uh, and the distribution between pilots for growth and pilots for uh, to cover up for retirements and replacements is pretty equal. It's around 350,000 in each bucket. And also the geographical distribution is, is pretty evenly spread. Uh, we have here divided it between Americas, Europe and Africa, and uh, Asia and Pacific. And you can see it's around 100,000 pilots in each region. What's really interesting in this slide is that 300,000 pilot, pilots, that's pilot that has uh, made it to the airline, which is not the same as 300,000 pilots that has graduated from an ab initio school. Um, I have had inputs from several airlines and they are everything between 1 to 5 to 1 to 10 in the ratio of application and acceptance. And if you take a ratio of 1 to 10, well, you need to produce 3 million pilots to uh, onboard 300,000. Then captain upgrade uh, on top of it, uh, there will be a lot of new co-pilots, but there will be a lot of new captains. And uh, the prediction is that the pilots will have a record career, spend very few years as co-pilot, and of course the, the average experience level on a global basis will be much less than we are used to. 
And then as I just mentioned, the, the business pilot side, uh, almost entire number of pilots will be changed out over the coming years. So the question we get from the industry uh, more than often is how can we support in creating more pilots faster? And that comes with a subset of, of questions and the big concerns around the, the declining uh, experience level and uh, the quick progression from co-pilot and then the quick career to become uh, commanders. So I'm going to just quickly touch on two initiatives that C is taking to try to support. The first one is smarter pilot creation, and then, uh, which is, of course is targeted on, on getting more pilots into the industry, co-pilots. And the second one, better recurrent training system, which is focused on how we can uh, support in maturing young co-pilots quicker to a position as a commander. So uh, one of the bottlenecks in creating more pilots is uh, the production capability. And uh, we definitely want to make sure that we optimize the use of our production capability, our Benicio schools, to produce pilots that ends up in airlines. Uh, we don't want to use our resources for leisure pilots or, or pilots that don't make it to the airlines. And also, through our training, we want to make sure that we optimize the process. Uh, we uh, re minimize the number of remedial training sessions and dropouts. And for that, you need basically two things. You need to have an effective trainer program, which uh, we consider having. And the second one is you need to have a good screening and selection process to make sure that you have the right pilots entering into the school and eventually graduating uh, with the airlines. And C has over a year we have improved our uh, pre-assessment system and uh, we are lining it up against the uh, eight competences uh, and uh, then once graduated we try to correlate it with the airline and their uh, profile for pilots and, uh, in the airline. And in, in line with those uh, um, activities, we have managed to uh, launch 10 new pilot creation programs the, the last three years. We are building on already established anchor customers in Asia and in Europe. And we're entering the market in the Americas as well with uh, three new programs to support uh, pilot cadets to uh, Aeromexico and American Airlines and, and JetBlue. Quickly touching on the recurrent training. Recurrent training is very much in evolution and uh, we are slowly moving towards more of evidence-based training, competency-based training and data-driven training decisions. And the challenge that we saw was that many airlines, they will just keep the co-pilots for a very short time. They will have less time to monitor their progress and see how they mature into a, a commander. So, at the same time, uh, there's more emphasis and more focus on the soft skill part of training, uh, decision making, cooperation, uh, the soft skill competences. And say so you wanted to uh, create more bandwidth for the, co for the instructors and the bigger focus on the, the fly path management and on the, uh, adherence to SOP. The challenges the instructors have more than often is that there's so much going on in the, in the cockpit and uh, there's so many activities that you're going to monitor. And in a very standard maneuver, uh, the instructor, they had to f monitor both flight part control, uh, they have to monitor the cooperation, the adherence to procedures and SOP. But CIA has developed this system that automatically collects data from the simulator to measure how the pilots perform against all the maneuvers, uh, the flight path. And the system gives deviation and suggests the score. And that allows the instructor to better focus on the soft skill and the soft skill performance of the crew. And then finally, uh, final word around the 
female in flights. We are up against an unprecedented need for pilots. Uh, and yet, as an industry, we only manage to attract very few pilots on the uh, female side. Only 5% of the global pilots are females, and uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons we believe is that there are very few role models, so we have decided we're going to sponsor five female pilots every year, full sponsorship, and we're going to nurture them and make sure that we place them with airlines, and uh, we're going to expose them as role models for other females. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vishal. Um, we are running uh, short of time now, so the next speaker is Mr. Nimal Siri. Uh, just an introduction to Mr. Nimal Siri is the uh, longest serving Director General of Civil Aviation in the Asia Pacific region. We call him the Dean of DGs. So. Good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. My presentation consists of two parts. Uh, the presentation uh, of about three minutes of three slides, followed by a short video about uh, our domestic uh, MGAP activities in order to educate our children in Sri Lanka. I'd like to share with you uh, uh, these points. We are the immediate shortage and critical hotspots throughout the world and why. In regard to where this problem exists, I think it is all over the whole aviation industry, inclusive of manufacturer, service provider, operator, and regulator. As we all know, in majority of states, this aviation industry is relatively young, and it was very recently a number of people started retiring. And also, in majority of states, the aviation industry is very small, and workforce requirement was very limited, and it is only now it is in the increase. And also, there is no national stream of constant supply of trained aviation personnel, like in other disciplines. Also unable to offer attractive remuneration packages because uh, most of the aviation industries in the region are still governed by the government and as a result uh, strict uh, 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 the salary structures are applied. Not accessible to majority of population and public knowledge and awareness is therefore very limited. And also economic contribution of aviation uh, to the growth of national economy is not identified or quantified in majority of states and therefore the prominence given to aviation is very limited. And dearth of training, resources, instructors, facilities and OJT opportunities. Training is also time consuming and costly. Also limited resources and more demanding priorities for social welfare when it comes to government. So a focus on aviation is very much limited. And lack of forecasting and planning is also one of the concerns. Next slide. Uh, Continuing, uh, industry is expanding and rapidly, and also it is becoming very complex. Competency should be of world standards, and it cannot be met with local standards. And there also, therefore, it is subject to various external agencies, audits, and evaluations. Technology is rapidly growing, requiring retraining frequently. Also, global exposure is necessary to have optimum performance. Stringent conditions of medical fitness need to be maintained in regard to certain disciplines. Also, the major problem is now there is a clear demarcation between the regulator and the operator, 
and as a result, Regula has a huge challenge as to how he, his own staff can be dual. Basically, the regulator should have know-how of the operational requirements, and as a result, a regulator has faced with a serious problem. Limited involvement of women in technical areas, and as a result, catchment is again somewhat limited. New players are entering, like drones and spacecraft, which brings additional challenge. Security risk is in the increase, and vigilance needs from every facet, and that's again requiring a lot of talents. Public pressure for higher safety level, efficiency, regularity, and productivity is also to be met. World pressure for increased environmental responsiveness is also to be of importance. When we look at uh, ICAO's uh, statistics as to the regulator's ability to perform safety oversight, uh, about out of 184 states which ICAO had audited, 71 states have less than 51% of 50% uh, of score. Uh, that is, uh, 71 states do not have uh, adequate uh, technical personnel and also training given to them. When we look at how are we addressing those shortages and how well are they working, uh, our view is that informing the policy makers of air transport potentials for national economy and trying to Mainstream aviation into the national development projects would be of utmost importance. Creating public awareness of the potentials in aviation through media is again a necessity. Re-employment of retired personnel where age is not a restriction is also a, an alternative in the interim. Increasing remuneration packages would attract people to be uh, employed and retained, and also relaxing employment of foreign nationals. In certain states, foreign nationals are not allowed to be employed in certain disciplines. Pooling of resources, that is training instructors and inspectors, and also harmonization of rules and regulation will enable us to share uh, human capital. What plans are in place to address the forecast a shortage in the future, taking into account corporate goals such as gender and diversity. Are they enough? Our view is postulation of demand and supply is very necessary so that early planning can be, take place. Development of human capacity metrics is needed for each state. Elevation of industry remuneration and providing concessions and perks uh, like uh, due to be uh, concessions uh, and some sort of additional perks for industry personnel to be trained and retained. Expanding opportunities for hands-on training need to be uh, worked out. And also uh, uh, because cadres of certain uh, organizations are limited, engagement of voluntary workers will also expand the uh, ability of uh, having hands-on training and education of young generation, which is undertaken under NGAP very thoroughly, and also pooling of resources through regional approach is also considered of importance. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is uh, the end of my three slides presentation, and uh, I'd like you to share with some of our attempt uh, to, to educate our local nationals uh, in regard to aviation. We have a short uh, video of two minutes. Kindly watch that.
presentation Thank you. to less than four minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, the host said I only have five minutes, so I'm very happy to be here to give you a quick introduction about China. I come from a COMAC, and we have a three products, 9A919 and C929, and the second two are still in the R&D pipeline, while for LG, which has already been put into operation in the lines. So you can say that for the manufacturing industry, I think all of you sitting here are the leaders and the experts from the aviation industry, and probably you guys know this industry pretty well, even better than me. I find out for the commercial aviation industry, it's now facing some challenges due to the Thailand shortage. And that's why I would like to provide you some insights from my side. I think this industry is developing too fast. In the next 20 years, more than 42,000 aircraft worth 56 trillion US dollars will be delivered worldwide. China is a fast-growing region, and we're going to have 900, 9,000 newly added passenger jets worth 1.3 trillion US dollars. And this system is also highly complicated, with millions of the components and thousands of the system. At the same time, you know that the training period for the pilot is pretty long, and we are also encountering new te technologies, which is also a great challenge for us to recruit and maintain the pilots. For example, artificial intelligence, as well as the hypersonic, additive manufacturing, augmented reality, as well as the new technologies and new materials. Well, at the same time, because this industry is developing quite fast, and the time-consuming training is really a handic for most of the international counterparts. So I made the following summary. You can say that for an undergraduate student or the postgraduate student who wants to get into the manufacturing industry, it takes three to five years for them to become an independent qualified engineer. So the training is quite time-consuming, while at the same time our industry is full of competition. We have Boeing, Airbus, and even the manufacturers from Japan, Russia, and from China are all getting into this market. So we also have a very furious competition to recruit the best talents. We also have some competitions from the general aviation, automobile industry, or even the internet industry. They are also trying to recruit our staff to work for them. So that is really the talent shortage problems we are facing. We have the following countermeasures. 
First of all, I think we still need to create our industry as a decent industry. We can provide uh, a better financial incentives, even salaries, to the market. And we need to benchmark ourselves with our international comp competitors to provide a decent job and a decent offering to our staff. And my second solution is that as we are recruiting the talents and competing with the internet companies, we probably need to benchmark our salary with that of the internet companies to try to recruit the talents and maintain them. And uh, my third thought is that according to our understanding over the young talent, we found out the younger generation is quite important to our manufacturing industry of the aircraft. So at every stage of the career development, we have to make specific analysis to try to understand that their detailed demand on specific phases to provide them as a corresponding offering, corresponding career growth pathway, and the corresponding personal development tactics so that we can help to recruit and retain those talents to work for us for the longer term. More importantly, our industry has a very time-consuming circle for the manufacturing, and the uh, aircrafts in our pipeline nowadays can only be put operation into 10 years and then started to make profits in 20 years. So how can we make sure that we can provide the financial incentives and the compensations to our existing engineers and R&D staff? We will also need the mid and long term strategies to help to recruit the talents to join our team. More importantly, I would like to talk about the lifelong training and education. We have to start even from the primary schools and the middle schools to help to trigger the interest, the students' interest over aviation so that they could be interested in aviation. And in this way, we can help to expand our talent pool even from the primary school stage. And more importantly, we are now working with some universities and enterprises to make sure that some of the industrial needs and the demands could be reflected in the curriculum provided by the aviation schools. And more importantly, and during the schooling hours for the postgraduate student, they spend the first year year in study the series, and since the second year on, we will ask them to join our R&D project and to make sure they have some handy experience so they can have some good understanding about our industry. Right after graduation, those students can accommodate to the industrial development as quick as possible. Last but not least, we also establish our COMAC university. We are not using this university to train the undergraduate or postgraduate students who are joining hands with the university universities and uh, research institute in China to jointly discuss how we can have a better educational curriculum over the aviation talents. We are also making the discussion and the joint research over the leadership, management capacity, and uh, the new ways of handling the new technology so that we can help to accommodate the development of the general aviation industry and the commercial aviation industry or even the business aviation industry to help to complement the shortage of the pipelines that we are facing now for CO, uh, COMAC. We only celebrated our 10th anniversary of the establishment. We are still a young company in the manufacturing industry. So I hope that all the experts and audience sitting here and uh, please support us in the near future. Thank you very much. However, I would uh, ask, uh, take one question from the audience. Um, so I have some questions on the iPad. Strategies are being considered to address the projected shortage in competent and motivated flight instructor and other trainees. So, Yan, would you like to uh, address this question? First, um, do I understand well your question? Because we have a huge echo here on the platform. So, the question is uh, how to have uh, and to get some uh, suitable instructors? Yes. So we 
have uh, plenty of uh, solutions about this, but uh, some of them are not possible today due to regulations. You were mentioning uh, on the slides to use re retired pilot to act uh, as instructors at the flight school level. Uh, depending on the country, it's not possible. But is it one, one of the solutions to use experienced uh, airline pilots having the background of instructor to move to the initial training and to share their experience and expertise. The second solution, uh, which is uh, often mentioned, is to use new graduates as a flight instructor. It is another solution which is proposed by uh, our members. And I think both solutions are valuable. Now, in terms of uh, the big problematic of today for the flight instructors is the problematic of uh, recognition, salary, uh, work, uh, working condition, etc. And we have to, to find solutions for uh, all those problematic. Thank you. Any question from the audience? I see none. So I have a question for our panelists, and uh, uh, that's again, Jan. It's your bad day today. So this is one of the problems faced by the young qualified professionals to find a job in the airlines or related industry after investing a con considerable amount of money and time. In most countries, there's a disconnect between the training organization, say a flying training school, and the industry of the airlines. The number of unemployed pilots and engineers is staggering for an industry which is struggling to find experienced and qualified uh, professionals. The problem is that the experience in aviation sector cannot be gathered outside the industry, and only if they get a chance to work can they accumulate uh, the experience. Uh, how do you think we can deal with this problem as this large-scale unemployment is also a major deterrent for young people to consider aviation as a career option? Some airlines may have in-house training program for ab initio training, but most others prefer to recruit experienced personnel from open market and sometimes leads to unhealthy practice of poaching as a pool of experience and skill people are limited. What is your perspective on this chicken and egg situation? So I will try to, to make it short because it is a long question with plenty of implications. Um, first of all, we have uh, members who have only ab initio programs. That means they hire uh, on a regular basis only ab initio. So the ab initio training <coughs> and to join the airline is working perfectly. It is linked to, uh, generally speaking, historical issues and the culture of the, uh, the airline. So first point, it is possible to have only a bin issue feeding uh, the need of the airline. Secondly, in regards of the, um, the survey we have done, I speak by memory, but um, almost all of our members, they have uh, something balanced. That means they have, let's say, 30, 40 percent of a bin issue, um, 30 uh, percent of military, and maybe 40 of professionals. So uh, generally speaking, the problem is not to have only experienced people. And in the case of an airline who uh, hire only experienced people, how do they manage this issue? They rely on, a, let's say, a smaller airline who feeds the need of this airline. Typical example, domestic and regional operators hire new pilots to gain experience, and afterwards they join the international uh, network. I hope I answer approximately okay. your question. <laughs> So uh, thank you. I think we don't have time for any more questions. So I would like to uh, summarize the discussion uh, by just one sentence that this whole uh, area of training and human resource problem uh, is basically uh, based on four pillars. And the four pillars are the government, uh, the industry, uh, the training uh, organizations or the academy organizations providing training, and lastly, the 
young students. So they need to come together as never before. Uh, if we want to resolve the problems, and you have seen today uh, the kind of shortages, the kind of problems of demand and supply, uh, which is going to happen very soon. So there's a need to, for all these four pillars to work together uh, to find a problem, a solution to this uh, problem. Otherwise, uh, the growth figures which we are talking about, we will not be able to reach. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, panelists for their excellent presentations and thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you once again uh, all of you and I think uh, it's time for us. Yeah. Uh, so thank uh, another big round of applause for all of you. And the picture. Picture, please. Yeah. Just the, the picture for the panel, sorry. Later. Okay, so uh, we come back to, to our uh, uh, timing and uh, thanks uh, all of you for, for interacting with us. Uh, I think that uh, right now we will have the, uh, our third panel session uh, which is uh, entitled Women in Aviation Now and in the Future. Uh, as you might know, uh, the last assembly resolution uh, highlights the importance of gender and uh, the gender equity and equality and uh, we really focus under the ANGAP umbrella uh, of this topic. So uh, one of the areas that we are working now uh, under ANGAP is to, to highlight this, uh, this focus of ICAO and especially in the professional area how to manage to attract more women and girls. Uh, this, uh, this session uh, uh, it's uh, represented by uh, and will be moderated by uh, Ms. Poppy Koza, Director General of Civil Aviation Authority of South Africa, and uh, I will invite uh, Ms. Poppy Koza and uh, the esteemed panelists to, to participate and to come on the stage. Uh, as uh, I'm, and we are all big fans of, uh, of gender, equity and equality, uh, we've made uh, efforts to have at least uh, one representative from our side, so my colleague Henry will, will uh, keep up and represent us in this panel. So once again, uh, a big uh, round of applause for our panelists and uh, Ms. Poppy Koza, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Uh, dear delegates, welcome to Panel 3 discussion. As I have been introduced, my name is Poppy Koza. I am from the South African Civil Aviation Authority and I am indeed delighted to be moderating this panel which will discuss an issue that is very close to my heart, and that is women in aviation. So our panel will um, unpack the question, how can we promote diversity, including a gender-balanced workforce in aviation? So our esteemed panelists will individually share with us presentations on specific uh, subtopics on women in aviation issues. They will be provoking our thoughts on how to deal with gender equality and empowerment matters in our organizations as well as in our, in our countries. Uh, so in our panel we have Ms. Uh, Nicole um, Girard, um, who is the Acting Associate Assistant Deputy Minister Safety and Security from Transport Canada. Uh, if Nicole, if you can please wave because I see the sitting arrangement is slightly altered. Um, we also have Mr. Henry Goji, the head of Strategic Planning, Coordination and Partnerships Office um, that is in ICAO. I must indicate that I'm quite delighted to have um, a man in this panel because we cannot discuss gender issues without with men excluded. Uh, lastly, we have Ms. Um, Zhenxia Lu, uh, Engineering Team Manager from Airbus Beijing Engineering Center. And 
and we were supposed to have had Miss Kate um, latest, but due to unforeseen circumstances, she could not um, make it to, to the panel. So our panel have five minutes each to give their presentations, and then we'll go straight to um, the Q&A. Uh, I do welcome you to please post your questions online on slido.com, and I will then field the questions to our panel to respond as soon as they're done with their presentations. So firstly, I'm going to invite Ms. Nicole Gerard, uh, the Acting Associate Assistant Deputy Minister, uh, to come and share with us the Canadian experience on gender equality in transportation. A round of applause for her. Thank you. Hello, bonjour, amis collègues francophones. Uh, good morning. Uh, ni hao. We play uh, an important role in how we can break down the barriers for uh, women in underrepresented uh, groups in Canada. And you've heard many statistics. In Canada, when we look at uh, women who are pilots, they represent only 7% of our pilots in Canada. When we look at our aircraft maintenance engineers, uh, the number is slightly lower at 6%. Uh, yet, 50% uh, of our population uh, are women, so we certainly have a, an untapped uh, labor market that we need to work more towards. Uh, Canada has committed uh, more than $100 million to looking at uh, women and gender equality, uh, working at uh, finding ways to break the barriers, and also uh, to look at ways where we can uh, support women in non-traditional uh, work. We also have an important reconciliation agenda in Canada to look at our indigenous peoples. Uh, we have more than 300 isolated communities where they rely on air transportation for uh, medical services, for livelihood, for food, and, uh, and again, it is a population group that uh, we need to pay closer attention to. So we've heard the forecasts, we've heard the numbers, so what are the actions that we need to take not only as industry but as government? Uh, part of the statistics I also look at is uh, how do we desegregate all of the information. We see the population groups, we see the needs in terms of uh, uh, percentages that we need to increase, but out of that, what is that desegregated data? How many women do we need to target to be able to help uh, and uh, manage and increase our, uh, our labor shortage? Transport Canada has a four-pillar uh, uh, strategy focused on uh, awareness and education, on research, as well looking at supporting individuals and supporting institutions. We uh, also are, are doing uh, research looking at intersectionality. Intersectionality is when there is more than one characteristic uh, that has a compounding effect. So if we look at women and in indigenous peoples, for example, so that uh, um, compounded effect uh, creates even greater barriers that we need to uh, look at. Part of the awareness that we've uh, been identifying is how do we celebrate the women who are currently part of industry? How do we uh, raise their profiles so that our young women can have someone to look towards to as being feasible? I'm uh, from a small northern community in uh, northern Quebec, a province in Canada, and uh, accessibility in terms of different role models was not available. I would fly with my parents, but uh, I would only see male pilots, and I would see female flight attendants. So these were my role models. So breaking those barriers in terms of what is within the realm of possibility is so important today. We uh, have been celebrating uh, uh, women in our industry. So as an example, we have uh, Captain uh, Melissa Haney, who is one of uh, our first uh, Inuit female captains in this country. Uh, she became a captain about three years ago. And so we are celebrating her through the 99s, the International Organization Supporting Women in Flight, by uh, releasing a stamp that commemorates her achievement. Again, it's about creating that visibility, and it's about making sure that we are celebrating the uh, successes. 
One of the things that we're seeing as well is we uh, take for granted because you are all lovers uh, of aviation. Aviation is in your blood. But our young people don't actually know what aviation is. We have to, we have to interpret it, we have to break it down, and we have to uh, explain and provide them with information. And I know that uh, our colleague earlier was talking about in terms of uh, uh, possible uh, professions at airports. So what does that mean exactly in concrete terms? We have an organization uh, called Elevate in Canada that received uh, funding from the Status of Women to promote careers for women, but actually to bring the careers to these young girls so that on a week basis, uh, young girls from different high schools are brought together at an airport and uh, professions come to them to explain to them what exciting careers there can be in aviation. Part of the awareness as well is looking at mentorship and, uh, and seeing what kind of support we can offer. Uh, the Enge Engineering Society of the province of Ontario, as an example, has a, a mentorship program that only supports engineers who want to be licensed, but engineers who want to get into management and uh, leadership position. Again, it's about uh, making our services accessible to them so that they see and have the support. And when I talk about the support, I'm not only talking about women supporting women. Uh, we have uh, uh, men who are also so well versed and be able to provide uh, that insight. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to my colleague, uh, Francois Collins, who is the Associate Director General with me today of Civil Aviation, who is one of those examples who is eager and able and young <laughs> to be able to show uh, and share experiences uh, in the aviation world and is able to break down and help break down those barriers and be a positive role model. And again, uh, when we're talking about role models, it's about the role that you play men and women. The apartment that we see as well, and uh, if we look at statistics of women between the ages of 25 and 35, they enter their workforce and they're the ones who leave their workforce, uh, often because there are the conditions of the workplace is not conducive to them supporting the fact that they have children and are working. So what can we do to create that safe space? We also uh, hear, and there are statistics when I was in Cape Town uh, on behalf of Canada at the Gender Equality Summit that spoke about more than 60% of women in the aviation industry are victims of sexual harassment. So that's incumbent upon us, that's incumbent upon me as a regulator to see what can be done to make sure that we have a zero tolerance policy so that women feel empowered uh, in the workplace. There is the he for she movement that you would have uh, heard about through United Nations so that there can be commitments in terms of setting up appropriate targets uh, in uh, regards to, uh, again, providing that supportive network. Various initiatives exist in Canada. Uh, and part of the work that we are doing at Transport Canada is making sure that those individual efforts have a collective impact individually, like what Porter Airlines will have in terms of um, the women's soar uh, at Porter. Uh, Jazz Airlines also has an aviation pilot pathways program. Individually, they can have an impact, but collectively, it is the force of the results that will become important. Uh, we held uh, following on the heels of the, the Gender Equality Summit in Cape Town in August, Transport Canada held a labor summit shortage uh, in October in uh, Ottawa. And we brought not only regulators, but also uh, our different industry partners to see how collectively we need to address the labor shortage together. Again, our role as regulators is to enable those discussions, be that connecting point, and uh, allow us to have a good viable solutions. One of the, uh, and uh, when we look at where we, the differences that we can make as a regulator as well, but we hear is sometimes our regulatory regimes are too prescriptive. We heard yesterday in terms of how technology and existing pathways may not uh, collide and where we need to step up. So where is it as a regulator uh, do we need to break down those prescriptive so that we can be more competency-based, more uh, performance-based? 
We part of uh, the initiative that, can, that Canada has had as well is looking at uh, gender-based analysis uh, plus. Uh, part of uh, looking at intersectionality as well is looking at uh, where different aspects such as the LGBTQ uh, society, and I'm told I'm going to have to short, quicken my pace, uh, where uh, we need to look at the way that we use uh, terminology. So one of the changes we have done, for example, is moving from UAVs to RPAS to remote piloted aircraft systems away from unmanned air vehicles. We, uh, part of the initiatives at Transport Canada as well is looking at our leadership development initiatives where we uh, train uh, young uh, employees, uh, individuals who have an aspiration to become managers to also provide them with that mentorship. We've hired uh, last year over 300 students to come and explore the world at Transport Canada. We have student networks, we have young professional networks and as well as a middle management uh, network. So early engagement is so important to show guidance counselors the career paths that are possible, and as well finding ways to support the work-life balance uh, and encourage women, you know, not only to become professionals, but also to be able to balance the responsibilities of life at home. So I would say as a parting note that you cannot be what you cannot see. So I would urge you to find ways to open those pathways so that women can see themselves in this profession. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Gerard. Um, the takeaway from your presentation is around the issue of forecasting and planning, but also to make funding available. I was quite intrigued by your comments around raising profiles and celebrate women as well as to create visibility um, for role, role models, as well as the support provision and creating a safe place for women, coming up with policies that will prevent sexual harassment. I thought um, those were, were very uh, important aspects. Thank you very much. So we move on to um, the next presentation by Mr. Henry Goji. Uh, Mr. Goji will outline the ICAO's gender equality program and outcomes of the Global Aviation Gender Summit, which was held in South Africa in August, am I correct? So uh, Mr. Goji, uh, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Poppy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce to you ICAO's efforts to advance gender equality in aviation. These efforts are in support of the Sustainable Development Goals and specifically SDG 5, which focuses on the empowerment of women and girls and contribute towards the vision of leaving no country left behind. Gender equality and the advancement of women is of course closely linked to what ICAO and partners are aiming to achieve with the Next Generation of Aviation Professionals program, as Catalin had mentioned earlier. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna wanna go too much into the, the SDGs, but just to mention, uh, to summarize, in, in 2015, the UN member states adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which includes the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. This uh, landmark and universal commitment undertaken at the highest level can only be achieved through partnerships and well-coordinated cooperation with all sectors, including aviation, to jointly advocate and implement actions that will uh, advance the sustainable development. ICAO undertook um, a mapping exercise and looking at its five strategic objectives and how it links to these 17 uh, SDGs and determined that the work that we perform, uh, and that includes not only ICAO, but the industry, the member states, uh, all contribute to 15 of the 17 sustainable development goals, including SDG 5, which focuses on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. The UN advocates that by providing women and girls with equal access to education, healthcare, decent work, 
and representation in political and economic decision-making processes, economies will sustainably grow and societies and humanity at large will benefit. For SDG 5, ICAO is aiming to achieve the aspirational goal of 50-50 women-men by 2030 at all professional and higher levels of employment in the global aviation sector. This commitment was reaffirmed through ICAO's 39th Assembly resolution that was passed, which urged states, regional and international aviation organizations and the industry to take the necessary measures to strengthen gender equality. The resolution also called for the approval of the ICAO Gender Equality Program. So ICAO launched this program, which in, uh, included the development of an action plan, which is now being implemented. The action plan includes well-defined efforts to build capacity and enhance awareness of gender equality among staff, enhance gender representation by striving to increase the number of qualified women in the professional and higher categories to 50% at all levels. Increase accountability by having all the ICAO staff in the managerial positions take responsibility for ensuring the equal participa participation of women and men in all areas of work. Further engage with external partners by promoting gender equality in the global aviation community. I would like to share with you an initiative that will advance the implementation of this resolution. Four months ago, ICAO conducted the first ever Global Aviation Gender Summit, which was hosted by the South Africa Civil Aviation Authority, supported by the government of the Republic of South Africa through the Department of Transport. In fact, our moderator, Poppy, was instrumental to its success. Over 500 participants participated and more than 2,000 global viewers on YouTube Live streamed it. The summit was unique for two reasons. Firstly, it was the first ever global gathering to discuss gender equality in aviation from a life cycle perspective. And secondly, the summit brought together a wealth of cross-sectoral expertise provided by aviation representatives and the gender advisors from governments, industry, academia, the United Nations, foundations and associations, as well as non-governmental organizations. The summit concluded with the adoption of a set of concrete actions that will advance the implementation of the resolution and globally accelerate gender equality as well as empower women through the aviation sector. Within the roadmap of action that was, that was passed, industry and stakeholders are encouraged to consider 13 action points which relate to policy development, data generation, capacity building, and partnerships. In the interest of time, um, I can't go through all of them, but I do want to highlight just on one of them related to partnerships, but all of them are equally important. Partnerships highlighted in the roadmap include the ones between ICAO and UNESCO around education and STEM to foster the development of a future talent pool of women in aviation. ICAO is also working with the UN Women to promote the He for She campaign, and Nicole mentioned that earlier, and explore the feasibility of introducing a UN system-wide action plan on gender equality and the empowerment of UN women, uh, of women, and it's called UN SWAP. Uh, while this is for the UN, but we are expanding it uh, and trying this out to include national targets at the country level in select states. And this was a commitment made by the ICAO Secretary General at the, at the Gender Summit. So we will try to launch this in 2019. To follow up the 39th session of the Assembly resolution, ICAO is committed to promoting the participation of women in the global aviation through the joint efforts together with ICAO member states, organizations of the United Nations, as well as other industry organizations. 
We are hoping that the roadmap of actions concluded in the first ever Global Aviation Gender Summit will further enhance the consensus and commitment made by all stakeholders to ensure transition towards a sustainable and gender balanced aviation industry in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goji. It is quite um, humbling to note that indeed ICAO has taken a leading role in terms of advancing the women uh, equality and women empowerment issues. You've reflected on the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, particularly goal number five as it relates to gender quality, equality. Uh, you've also uh, elaborated on the ICAO Assembly Resolution uh, the action plan that is currently being implemented, as well as the collaboration um, amongst uh, uh, relevant stakeholders, including the UN agencies. So that is quite progressive. And I, my sincere hope is that states and organizations or the industry at large will take cue and indeed ensure that what the recommended actions that must be implemented are indeed uh, implemented. Our next presenter will be Ms. Zhenjia uh, Liu. Uh, the engineering team manager from Airbus, uh, Beijing Engineering Center, who will outline the importance of gender equality in the aviation sector and the need to accelerate progress. Ms. Zhenjia Liu. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be involved in this topic. You know, we, we always ask, why do we need the gender equality? Very simple, because women are half of the population, and women are half of the potential as well. 100 years after women got voting rights, but still, there are some areas dominated by male. What we have done to gender equality is far not enough. With equal opportunities in education and employment, we could accelerate the process. Okay, okay. Uh, empowering women in highly skilled uh, roles is a key element for a more inclusive and sustainable society. But who is the empower to do this? We will find the answer together. Uh, there's one fact I want to remind. Women have been earning more bachelor's degrees than men for decades. Uh, here is the example of uh, US. However, you could find that science, technology, energy, uh, engineering, mathematics, all majors are below 50%. The lowest one is engineering. It's only about 20%. Uh, we could do more to market the benefits of STEM career to attract young female students from very early stage. The career could bring higher value than general economy. The job is dynamic, creative, and challenging. And it is global, internationally standardized and recognized. The most important is you have the chance to change the world. Uh, uh, this is the Airbus global workforce forecast of next 20 years. Most new emerging jobs are STEM related. In, uh, only in 2018, this year, Airbus planned to recruit 7,000 newcomers worldwide. Uh, as we have learned in the previous panels, aviation industry is to double the size in 15 to 20 years. There will be a big dismatch between the graduates and the aviation huge demand. I really 
uh, invite you to take some time to read the global workforce forecast. Uh, it is a good implement to answer the questions of last panel, how to solve the problem of aviation skills shortage. Um, and also here I want to encourage more women to STEM area. There are more values, there are more chances, and there are very huge demands. Um, but women remain significantly underrepresented in Korea. On average, more than two-thirds senior and management positions are held by men. Uh, and I want to share more data in specific areas. Uh, globally, the technology-skilled jobs, only 30% are women. Uh, for the engineering in UK, it's only 11% are women. Uh, also, uh, we talked a lot about the pilot, uh, and we have learned only 5% of the pilots are women. And, and this number in China is only 1.3% pilots are women. So, how could you imagine that if women are 50% of the pilots, the pilots will double the size very naturally. So, it's really time for company to take concrete steps to double our efforts to make real progress equal opportunities and improve the representation across each level. Uh, talking about this, Airbus is putting a lot of efforts on the pipeline percentage. Uh, Airbus uh, Beijing Engineering Center example, 50% uh, of the engineers are women and also 50% of the team managers are women. Still, there are more efforts to do in each company and in each level to accelerate the process. Um, finally, I want to summarize to uh, some quick ways for all of us. Uh, industry, please set gender diversity as your strategy and review the status in any report because the gender diversity is as important as your finance status in the annual report. Uh, for the school, um, please market the high-skilled careers to the young female students. Uh, then for everyone, please try to coach one female around you. Um, we could answer the question at the beginning, who is the who is the empower to achieve the gender diversity? All of us, we are the role model. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, um, Ms. Uh, Liu. Um, very interesting statistics that you've shared with us. Uh, I liked it when you said women make up half the population and therefore women can become what they want to be because women can change the world. Uh, you also encouraged uh, women to take uh, STEM subjects and you also challenged leadership positions um, indicating that uh, statistics uh, reveal that uh, women, um, there is a shortage of women uh, leaders and therefore we need to do more uh, in, in, the, in those areas. You've also in, um, challenged companies to take drastic steps to change the profile of the aviation industry by recruiting uh, more women. Thank you very much. Can I remind you once again uh, that if you wish to ask um, questions, you can post your questions on slider.com. I will then uh, field those questions to, to 
our panel. But before we do that, um, I've got follow-up questions for each of our panelists. I will start um, with um, Ms. Uh, Gerard. The first one, do we have adequate legislation or do we need to review legislation at state level to make gender equality a reality? Thank you for the question. Um, it's it's one I think that as a, a regular a regulator we uh, grapple with. Uh, can you um, impose as uh, as government what uh, I would say uh, makes sense from uh, imposing social conditions, uh, looking at uh, mandatory uh, maternity and paternity leaves? In Canada, um, a woman is uh, able to take one year off uh, from work. Uh, the challenge that occurs is that when she returns to the workforce and she hasn't exercised her skills as a pilot, uh, there are currency aspects that uh, are problematic and will uh, perhaps force her to return to the workforce uh, sooner than what she would like. So what can we do in terms of social conditions to allow her to play that role and not feel uh, uh, the stress of uh, being a, a superwoman? Uh, I would say as a, as a mother and as a daughter, uh, we live with uh, pressure all the time and we, we live with guilt all the time. Uh, guilt of being at home and not being at work and being at work and not being at home. So how can we as employers uh, support that? Um, in Canada, we also have the uh, Canada Labour Code requirements. So there are um, forms of uh, workplace conditions that are required. And next year, uh, sexual harassment will be part of these uh, uh, conditions that employers uh, need to pay attention to. Uh, Canada Labour Code requirements are uh, for federally uh, regulated institutions. So do we need to uh, impose that across the board? Again, it's uh, what do we need to do as employers, as government, so that our employees uh, feel safe? So how, how do we support uh, zero tolerance? How do we uh, impose a safe space? Again, it's uh, how we promote uh, the kind of culture in our work environment uh, to make sure that uh, all employees receive uh, similar uh, working conditions. So it's a tough question when we look at uh, what role does uh, government uh, need to play. Thank you very much. Um, the next question uh, is to Mr. Goji. You presented uh, the efforts ICAO is doing to advance gender equality uh, in aviation. In your personal opinion, what more need to be done to generate greater advancement? Uh, for um I think for uh, I, I think that's a that's a good question that any panelist would love to answer and there's there's uh, each one would have their area that they think that we should be focusing on one thing that was very surprising for uh, for myself that when we were looking at the SDGs and when it came to SDG 5 there is absolutely very little data out there to support that sustainment development goal. And that's not just for aviation, it's all, all the sectors that, for related to SDG 5. But for with respect for, for aviation, we do not have any comprehensive overview of data and statistics on gender. And this is an area that I would think that one of the areas that we absolutely need to focus and came out and was one of the outcomes from the gender summit as well. Um, we are very well positioned to be the first in the sector, uh, first to support this SDG 5 with data. Uh, ICAO and its governance structure, the way we are all here today representing the UN, representing states, representing international organizations and the industry is how we, in aviation we're structured and, and to move our the agenda forward. We are well positioned to be able to collect this data and I think this is something that uh, we're all committed to that uh, uh, ICAO could be the, the, uh, the um, main platform to collect this data 
in uh, coordination with the international organizations and working with ACI, Cancel, IATA, and also with the member states to work out to what are the data sets that we'd want to collect this information. Mm -hmm. uh, with this information, we'll be able then to uh, create baselines, monitor performance, uh, and create targets. And perhaps this data can then be shared in a transparent manner of which then would would be able to help achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve. Well, thank you very much. That's quite insightful. Um, the last question from my side uh, to um, Ms. Liu. Uh, statistics in terms of focus suggest that there is greater demand in the technical fields, um, as, uh, particularly in the next uh, 20 years. On the other hand, uh, the technical fields can be so intimidating because it is pretty much male dominated and I think that is backed up by the statistics that you shared with us. So how do we get more women involved um, in these fields? fact, I, I think uh, for the school, not only universities, at the very beginning of the education, um, even the parents, the family, the society, they could uh, market more, the, more about the science things to the kids and uh, start, start to, to attract the interest. It's the, I think it's a presentation from Sri, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, they already launched a program to attract the youngs to the aviation. Uh, this is a very good practice for industry and also for the schools. Thank you very much. I have to squeeze in a question or two from the audience. Um, the first question is directed um, to Mr. Henry Goji, and the question says, how can governments, organizations, or companies eradicate, eradicate the inequalities in respect to salary discrepancies amongst women professionals? It is proven that women still earn less salaries as opposed to their male counterparts, even though they are doing the same job. Very important question. Okay, it's it's a good question, and it, and it, uh, and I think there are. Um what we need to do is, as I, I said, I, I talked about the data part. Uh, Nicole answered the question on the legislation element, and, and it is a this whole the whole element with gender is very complex because it's uh, for every government, and they have their own laws, and their um, it, it makes it quite challenging. However, I think that uh, the fact that uh, we are talking about it, we are tre achieving. Uh, agreed goals uh, that we should all be working together. I think in our sector for aviation, we are able to, to make good progress in this particular area, especially the fact that we do have a resolution. We, but it's a soft resolution. There's no hard commitments to it. It states have to volunteer to, to, to do what they can. But I think now that we've had the gender summit, we've come out with stronger outcomes, much stronger outcomes. ICAO needs to look at this now. How do we bring the outcomes of this gender summit to the next General Assembly? Does it require strengthening the resolution to have more commitment from states to then have to work with their industry sure. to bring this type of change. Uh, so I think it's, it's a little bit slow, but I think we are in a much better position than any other sector to make good progress. Thank you very much. The last question I will ask, and you, uh, you will decide uh, perhaps between Nicole and um, Zhenjia, who, who takes it, or both of you perhaps can share insight. Um, it says, um, how to react to unfair treatment at work when the leadership is dominated mostly by men? I think that question was partly um, answered, but just in brief. Uh, for, uh, make sure I understand that the question is unfair leadership. Huh? I beg your pardon? Mm, Must I repeat the question? The question. The question says how to react to unfair treatment at work 
when the leadership is dominated mostly by men. I encourage everybody to speak up. To speak up to your company, to your line manager, because every, every company encourages the open communication and support the STD of United Nations. Speak up. Yes. Thank you. Speak up. Thank you. Uh, Nicole? I would just uh, add that uh, yes, you're, you're going to have, and, and, and pardon me, your male dinosaurs, you know, that uh, perhaps don't see uh, uh, women the same way, and, uh, but you are going to have allies. I would say find your ally, allies, and, uh, and when you see it, call it. Find your alliance. So in the interest of time, I think we are two minutes um, um, what is it, the word? Yeah. Uh, we've, we've stolen two minutes uh, from the program director. I will now conclude. Um, as one great Nelson Mandela once said, and I quote, as long as women are bound by poverty and as long as women are looked down upon, human rights will lack substance. Close quote. He further said, I quote, if you want to change the world, help the women. Close quote. I now invite you to join me in thanking our panel for sharing their insights with us on this very important topic. And as they return to their seats, let us give them a big round of applause. Thank you to our panel. on innovations and solutions to address NGAP challenges will be moderated by Mr. Claude Hurley, President of the Air Navigation Commission of ICAO. Mr. Hurley, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you for coming back from the break. There's always a risk that we lose some of you, but I'm glad to see the room is filling up again. So, Nehal, Good morning, dear excellencies, colleagues, and all of you, the next generation of aviation professionals. Xie Xie, thank you as well to our hosts, Shenzhen's Municipal People's Government, Beihang University, and the Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics. What a great opportunity that we can come here together this week to discuss this important topic. What we've heard earlier today was predictions that airline passengers will double in the next 20 years. And as a consequence, we'll soon need thousands more pilots, engineers, cabin crews, air traffic controllers, and other aviation professionals, thousands more than current training facilities can produce. This prediction is that unless we can ramp up recruitment and training, that some aircraft will be parked instead of flying passengers. On the other side of the coin, the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs study predicts that five million jobs will be lost in the next two years as artificial intelligence, robotics, and other socioeconomic factors replace the need for human f workers. The conclusion can only be that we don't know for sure what the future will look like, but it's certainly worth thinking about, especially in terms of how do we attract the next generation of aviation professionals and help them prepare for the future, their future. So the question before us as we look at innovative solutions to address the NGAP challenge are, how can we prepare the youth of tomorrow for jobs that we cannot even imagine today? skills should end gaps learn? How are we rethinking human resources, education, and economic approaches? So to put things in perspective, if you'll allow me a few seconds to reflect on the path taken by the current generation of aviation professionals, imagine a young me, if you will, as an eight-year-old boy, which wasn't as long ago as you might imagine by my looks. 
I recall with fondness the obsessive intensity of a new passion and wanting to learn as much as possible about anything to do with flying. I wanted to fly as if my life itself depended on it. I memorized the tail logos of the world's airlines. Mind you, it was some years ago and there were a lot less airlines than the 5,000 airlines currently assigned ICAO codes. I remember as well that it could differentiate from miles away if the three engine aircraft on long final at my local airport was a Boeing 727, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, or a Lockheed 1011 TriStar. We rarely see those aircraft in our skies today, but my passion for aviation remains. And the point is that the world of aviation, of it, aviation today, or even the one I joined, was a different one than I imagined as a boy. So the key for NGAPS might be that current aviation professionals, we need to ignite that passion for aviation, whatever aviation will look like in the future, in the youth of today, and to nurture it. We together need to find innovative ways to support those newly found passions of today's youth. That's the task before us today in the years to come. To help us along this path, please allow me to introduce the first of our excellent five speakers in this panel. First up will be Mr. Indana Babakara Rao, who will speak to us about the economic benefits and challenges of a rapidly changing aviation future job market. Mr. Rao holds a master's degree in industrial engineering from Andara University and led the modernization of Delhi's Indira Gandhi International Airport into a world-class airport, was its chief executive from 2011 to 2018, and is presently sector head of airport construction as executive director, GMR Airports in New Delhi. Mr. Rao, you have the floor, sir. Again, good morning to all of you. Just we'll talk about uh, aviation. Aviation is not just airports and airplanes alone. It's a wide spectrum of uh, right from uh, starting the journey to end to journey, from inspiration to booking of tickets, and also preparation of the journey, coming to the airport to take the flight and take the, the airline in flight, then come down destination and ultimately land into the place. So it's actually, it's aviation is a completely spectrum of a whole energy. And so many partners are in this gen, uh, energy, in the journey, completely if you look at all the things and all, various partners are there in this journey. Coming to, we all know that aviation is growing leaps and bounds, especially in Asian markets compared to Europe and US. Especially look at the global aviation. Last uh, 15 years has grown very rapidly. If you take last 50 years, it's a five times has grown. In fact, uh, the growth is so huge. It's a good problem to all of us, in fact. Just go back. Uh, how these uh, economies have been ruled? In the 18th century, if you look at that, waterways played a vital role in logistic transportation and journeys. 19th century, railways came into picture. They took the entire journey. 20th century, roadways, huge road network has come, all parts of the world, and they have taken journey. Now, 21st belongs to the aviation sector. So, we are the sector where this century belongs to us, so the use. If you look at it, around $2.7 trillion economy has been given by this aviation sector to the whole GDP. And the huge employment potential also given to that. Just some statistics to give an idea. Around 65.5 million pass jobs have been created worldwide in the aviation sector. Around 57 travelers are traveling, tourists are traveling by air in the world. And if you take it just simple, 10.2 million direct jobs are created by the aviation industry. Very interesting is 35% of the trade value created by the aviation sector 
with less than 1% traveled by air. Imagine how much impact is creating for this industry and also the state economy respect to countries. Let us see that. What are the global drivers for change in the impact of the aviation industry? If you classify it basically, one is society, the terrorism, new modes of con consumption, data privacy, these are the social factors affect the global aviation. Then comes to technology. Cyber security, all of us know nowadays we're talking about cyber security. Robotics and automation, 3D printing, they're all sort of technologies going to be revolutionize and impact our aviation industry. And next important burning topic, all of us, environment. We're talking about environment. How the aviation sector can able to manage the environment impacts, especially carbon emissions raising sea levels, etc. how we can manage the industry can sufficiently control environment pollution. It also has impact on our industry. And it comes to the economy, of course, we are directly related to that. Respect to economies. Oil prices, all of us know that, is a major contributing factor for growth or degrowth of the aviation industry. And also labor, local regional laws, government policies comes into picture. Last but not the least, politics. It also plays a vital role in economics of the aviation industry. The local laws, protectionism, securing, and also anti I mean, what you call the uh, competition, geological ability, all these things factors also affect the aviation industry. In nutshell, these are the global drivers, not only for positive and also negative. This impacts the uh, aviation industry. Aviation industry has a lot of challenges, right from high cost of fuel, and also another important thing is currency fluctuation that also impacts the industry between the countries. High operating costs of the airlines and the aviation industry. Shortage of maintenance facilities. We are all talking about number of aircrafts being being ordered. Where is the maintenance facilities for them to operate, to manage? And very, very important, lack of pilots and skilled manpower. That's a huge shortage the industry is going to face going forward. And also there's unpredictable possible behavior. Sometimes how and what, very difficult to predict the passenger's behavior. That also impacts a challenge, big challenge for the aviation industry. And also, as I said earlier, the good problem, the capacity constraints also has come to the big issue. Since the growth is being beyond our expectations. So these are the challenges. Now, out of the challenges, let us focus on today's topic of lack of qualified pilots and what is skill man. What we have, what is exactly, what is impacts for us? We all know nowadays we're talking about digital transformation. Yes, what it impacts us. The first and foremost, we're talking about earlier the journey was simply transaction, taking ticket, taking the flight and get out. There is no more. It is experience. So digital transformation provides experience to the travelers. Knowing his data, exchange of data, what he likes, what he doesn't like, so how to treat him. The second is enabling a code complete the ecosystem. There's one single platform which everybody can come into picture, right from ticket agents, right from ground handlers, right from hoteliers, cab operators, airport operators, airlines, all one platform. It also gives a big change and also gives experience to the aviation industry. And also digital enterprise. Now we're talking about artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, IoT, all the things comes as improve the productivity and also efficiency of the assets performance. That gives a good input. That also gives with less labor, obviously. And also safety and security. Now time is short. I'll quickly move through. Two minutes, sir. Excellent. The aviation job market is a lot more. Requirement, procedure, implications and all. 
I'll go to just one important point for all of us to know. Many of us talk about it. What is the aviation industry talks about it? We need the people to have ambition to grow, value for money, articulation, how to communicate effectively with the industry, expertise, and also skills. Skills means you're talking about soft skills, very important in this industry. We in India, we are talking about we are talking about institutional strengthening, infrastructure capacity planning. We are doing training and process engineering, funding, and also monitoring evolution. What we are trying to do that. What our government doing is the government of India. By 2030, we expect about more than 300,000 uh, people required for us to have the skill. In our India, we have one ministry called Skill Development Ministry, exclusively headed by the Cabinet Minister. So this Ministry of Civil Aviation joined with the Ministry of Skill Development and look at the gaps, skill gap required for the aviation industry has been dot out. In fact, the signed member of understanding and putting Indian Aviation Academy to ensure to bring the skills gap to be brought into the table and be trained. In fact, in fact, we are also, the government of India is trying to contribute this called Aviation National Aviation Academy Initiative. The university is planning to build to see that requirement of the university, uh, aviation skills has to be taken care of. As a, just only this only just only one example for you. So at the Delhi International Airport, all of you know that it's about the 14th large, uh, biggest airport in the world today, is planning to contribute almost $40 billion in uh, 2025 and direct and direct induce employment of roughly 4 million jobs. You can imagine how we can able to impact the society not only by way of GDP growth but also by employment, by employment point of view. As a GMR, we also to have a part of this aviation industry, we have put our aviation academy training center where we have developed about 74 modules which required for the entire aviation end to end, right? From the operations, technology, information technology, airport engineering, landscape, cargo, you talk about dangerous goods, behavioral, very important one, security. We have 74 modules have been we have developed and training to the people and in fact we trained so far 33,000 people has been trained, has been employed in the industry, almost 95% of the people have been employed back. So the main success of this is identified the gaps, took the right people with the right attitude, have been trained in these areas, modules and been employed back. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rao. The most enlightening introductory presentation to this discussion on innovations and solutions to address and gap challenges. Next up to lead our discussions is Ms. Bo Huang, who will speak to us about rethinking human resources approach for future aviation professionals. Ms. Bo received a master's degree in aviation safety management and airworthiness, awarded jointly by ENAC, ICAA, and CAAC, CAUC, has previously served with Airbus China for 15 years as government affairs manager and regional sales manager, and is currently head of business development China of ATR. Ms. Bo, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to be invited to be here and to share with you the information of how to neuter the pilots. And today I'm going to touch upon four perspectives. One is to a brief introduction of our company, the challenges about regional aviation companies as well as the China's general aviation market, and then to discover some of the new solutions, how to uh, train the pilots in a new area. ATR Corporation was founded by two of the key aviation manufacturers in Europe, Airbus as well as Nerenado in Italy. It built 
airplanes using rotors. And currently, a, uh, it is founded in 1981, and it is the biggest civil rotor airplane company, accounting to 75% of the market share and have 37% of the market share with the regional airplanes with less than 100 seats. ATR in the regional market, especially for the re smaller airplanes market, had great success. Currently, we already sold more than 1,700 aircraft with more than 200 operators in 100 regions and countries. Recently, we just delivered the 1,500 ATR airplane. Regional air airline is not a niche market. It is an important component of the aviation transportation system. It's opening up new flights, connecting remote areas, and to provide and to disperse capacities for the trunk lines. It is accounting to 25% of the global fleet. Close to 300 million passengers are traveling with regional airlines. In the coming 10 years, the regional airlines will continue to develop rapidly. The introduction of a lot of airlines and uh, airplanes and more the um, routes need the participation of more pilots. And the biggest challenge is how to face the increasing shortage of pilots while ensuring security efficiency. We all know that regional flights are working more intensively and it's more challenging, especially for the new pilots. And some of the mature pilots, they're more willing to fly bigger planes to go to work for bigger airlines. So the regional airlines is in a severe shortage of experienced pilots. Actually, to fly in regional airlines as well as uh, rotor airplanes is important for their learning process. It will allow them to have a good understanding of the fundamental flying techniques as well as accumulate flight time. And we can say that the regional airlines is cultivating pilots for the whole industry as well as opening new airlines for the whole market. Next, in the next five years, and you know that every, every industry will in need of more ATR pilots. Currently, as far as I can see, that we have uh, 1,200 ATR aircraft with 10,000 pilots. And according to our delivery plan, every year we're going to newly deliver 80 aircraft with 600 newly added pilots, where we should also consider in our existing pilot team, around 50% of them will leave the job annually. Probably they go for other aircraft or they leave or retire due to the personal or medical reason. So you can say that uh, those kind of left over people around 1,500 per year. So we need around uh, 1,500 newly added staff every year. According to our estimation, in every year, ATR will in need of 2,000 newly added staff into our pipeline. So in the next five years, you can see that for the ATR pilots, it need to be more than 11,000 newly added ATR pilots in our system. Aviation industry is in need of the training of the pilots. It is quite costly and also time-consuming. <coughs> This is also the cost that all of us need to bear in mind. Generally speaking, we will need to recruit the staff from the trainee as the wise uh, pilot and then to be the chief pilot. Generally speaking, it takes two years for the initial trainee and then to be graduated, be qualified, and then be recruited by the ally and later building upon their flying hours and their experience to be promoted. Generally speaking, it takes six to seven years to produce a qualified pilot, especially for those large aircraft. It need probably need more time. 
for all the airline companies. We need to make the training schedules right before we introduce the aircraft. And at the same time, we should also have the specific crew training, cabin crew training, and the pilot training, and the maintenance technician training. So I think actually for the trunk lines, indeed, it's more at the end of our industry. There's still a lack of the chief pilot and highly qualified vice pilot as well as the instructors. We are at the same time due to the very costly and time-consuming training for some of the uh, self-paid uh, pilot. They probably will go for the commercial airlines to seek for job opportunities rather than to go to those small airlines. And I know that many of the big companies, for example, like Hansa as well as those international brands, they are also considering of shortening the training circle for the pilots and to reduce the cost for the training so that they can produce the high quality pilot in short term. So where will our next ATR pilots come from? Every year. We have uh, around uh, 1,000 newly aided second officers, and uh, currently many of them are coming from the graduates from the flying schools. And uh, for some big airlines, they are now willing to sign some uh, students still in the training project. And the tier number ADR operators haven't uh, taken the same approach. In order to take care of the ATR uh, pilot shortage problem, we are working with uh, a French university, that is ENAR, to have the ready-to-fly program now available for the local training options in Europe. And after the graduates uh, come out of the school, they can go to the airlines to do the handy experience. Well, at the same time, in order to recruit more fans or kind of passionate students in the ATR, ADR started to provide some uh, public campaign, for example, ATR communication strategies, institutional collaborations, or open days, or open door events, and the training material sharing. At the same time, we should also expand the scope of the talents. Currently, women only accounted for 3% of the aviation pilots, and uh, which is uh, really a good opportunity for the industrial and the regional in particular. In recent years, the regional aviation challenges in China has been further uh, elaborated by the government. We're still in the infancy stage. We have huge potentials in the near future. And you can see that uh, more and more domestic airlines started to use the mid and the large aircraft to take care of the short shortage um, travels. Well, from the fleet development, and China still work on those large scale or the big jets. By the end of April 2018, currently we have the pilots for the uh, aircraft for the air civil aviation industry around 3,331, while regional airlines only accounted for 1.9 percent from the passenger traffic. And uh, in China, we have 32 airports that takes 90 percent of the total passenger traffic, while for other 100 airports, they only take care of 1.5 percent of the passenger throughput. Well, general aviation is the emerging industry with the support from the market and the industry is now developing pretty fast. The Chinese civil aviation also launched many preferential policies. And for the 35-year plan, by 2020, we're going to more than have more than 5,000 aircraft. And uh, generally speaking, we're going to be in need of newly aided 10,000 pilots. So you can see the shortage of the talent is still a big bottleneck for our future development. According to our estimation, in the next 20 years, China is going to have 1,100 jets that can help to take care of the regional lines and the short lines in China. ATR, as the professional supporter in this industry, we're going to support the allies to create the innovative service and the localized solution to our clients. By 2020, China will be the largest aviation transport 
transport market with the rapid development of the aviation industry and the need of the pilots is also increasing. In taking care of the future pilot shortage, we should also discuss new models to train the pilots. Let me just uh, uh, just say a few words. We have to reduce the training cost and shorten the training circle. Regional allies and uh, general aviation allies and the short distance aviation transport allies need to have the specific tailor-made training institutions to work with our industrial practitioners to have the aircraft specific training programs to provide the job opportunity to the applicants. And especially when we started to recruit and select the, our, the, 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 the potential candidates, we have to find out those ones who are qualified with our uh, company background and our culture and to make sure that in our curriculum, we can allow the students to have the trainees at the school and also be trained with industrial practice. And you can see that this program should actually be the, a whole lifelong journey for the aircraft, uh, for the pilots, to make sure the pilots can actually help to uh, cater the needs for the qualified pilots at the airlines, compared with the transportation airlines. I think for us, like a passenger airlines, we have to attach its great importance to the training for the regional airlines and the general aviation lines to fully utilize our resources to make sure that regional allies could also be a very important training base and it could also serve as a channel for between the general aviation and the transport aviation so as to promote the industrial development. Thank you very much. Ms. Bo, and uh, it's clear to me after your excellent presentation that uh, clearly the challenging future that we all face needs to uh, could benefit from a different HR approaches. So thank you for that discussion. Next up to co-lead our next discussions are professors Haijun Wang and professors Graham Hunt, who will speak to us both about educating to meet the needs of the future global aviation community. Dr. Huang holds a PhD in transport operations research, is the author of over 200 academic papers published in prestigious international journals, and is currently helping build a better future for the next generation of aviation professionals as vice president of Beihang University. Dr. Huang, you have the floor, sir. Good morning. I'm very happy here. I uh, have this uh, opportunity to share the experience in educating and training uh, the next generation aviation professionals. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to have the chance to share with you the training and education of the next generation aviation professionals. As we can see that in yesterday and in the previous two sessions of this morning, we heard a lot of speakers in talking about the micro trends for the civil aviation industry. Then I would like to analyze those trends. And now we can clearly say that the whole industrial development is in need of the professionals. Especially, we try to understand the market, the technical advancement, and some new challenges to our industry. But uh, first of all, please allow me to work you through the situation in China. In the next 20 years, we're going to newly added 6,330 aircrafts with a total value of uh, 950 million US dollars. So in this way, in China, in order to cater the needs for the next two decades, we have to newly train around 3,000 pilots per year. And uh, we will need around 8,000 land supporting staffs every year. So this is a great challenge for the industry here in China. Well, for the aviation professionals, what kind of skill sets they need to have? They need to have the global vision, systematic thinking, collaborative spirit, and innovation spirit. Well, for those next generation of the professionals, they need to immerse into the diversified culture. They can quickly respond to any changes happened in the industry. Here is a picture showing you the qualities of the future talents. 
including the very strong professional skills, solid scientific foundation, fine humanist qualities, and a strong intercultural competency. So for a Beihang University, especially the flying schools and the higher educational institute, we have to consolidate the scientific research in the curriculum, combining the teaching with industrial practice. And in all those sectors, we have to fully demonstrate how technology, culture, and the skills can work for Italians with international horizon. Next, please allow me to introduce you Beihang University and some of our practice in training the aviation professionals. Our university was established in 1952. We are a university specific in the aviation, aeronautics, and astronautics development. Chinese government attaches great importance to the development of this university. In our university, we have 33 schools related to aeronautical science and engineers. The blue block covers almost engineering types of the schools. But in order to guarantee the scientific plus the humanitarian development, we also have some science and humanities-based uh, department, including the mathematics and the physics, chemistry, and even the biological medicine. We also have uh, the yellow and orange color blocks. They are the social relevance schools. Especially in recent years, we also started to explore new horizons for the international joint training. We have the China Advanced Study in Humanities, and we also have a flying school and the Sino-French Engineering School and a General Engineering Flight College. And currently, we ranked at the first one for the aerospace engineering according to Shanghai Ranking 2018. And we are also among the leading universities in China that has wonderful scientific research production outputs. And aeronautics and aerospace is the best a major of our university. We also have a very good rankings for other main disciplines, including instrument science, technology, material science and engineering, software, physics, and mechanics. During the past 60 years, for Beihan University has contributed a tremendous amount of talents for the China's aviation industry. Our flying academy has provided thousands of special category pilots for the southern China. Airlines. During the past several years, our international uh, education has been enhanced. Currently, we have close to 2,000 um, international students studying in our campus, and our international engineering institutions are using foreign language to teach the lessons. We have a lot of uh, international programs uh, as well as a coordinated training for the students. In order to enhance their innovative capacities since 1990, Every single year, we are going to organize the interpretation in innovation and enterprises uh, competition. Thousands of students will participate in the competition. We had some outstanding results. Some are favored by the market and attracted venture capitals and formed companies, as some already got good reputations and went uh, got, got public. And currently, we had international corporations. We are partnering with close to 200 international high-level institutional educational institutions and site strategic agreements. Every year, more than 2,000 students will participate in exchange programs, including double-digit programs. Close to 2,500 students will study abroad. All of these efforts are for the 
developing of a highly high quality future proof talent so that they have solid science knowledge as well as outstanding engineering capacity, international fission, cross culture communication capacity. In this way, our innovation of aviation company can have excellent talents to provide a, a foundation for sustainability. And we also partnered with some tier one aviation companies providing opportunities for our students to work there, including AVIC, AECC, COMEC, Airbus, Boeing, and Honeywell. These are all of our partners. We provided many practice experience and possibilities for our students. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Next up at the podium is Professor Graham Hunt, who, after gaining a PhD in human factors, led a number of initiatives benefiting NGAPS, including a research program in New Zealand for the CAANZ, designing a competency based commercial pilot license. Professor Hunt is also well known in ICAO circles, having participated in ICAO's flight crew licensing and training panel, which adopted the new competency based multi crew pilot license in 2006. Professor Hunt is currently Vice Chancellor and Head of Asia for Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Professor Hunt, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and I'd like to thank NGAP and ICO for inviting me to this conference. Um, I, I want to make one very quick qualification. The, the, the uh, views that I am going to express now, or the vision I'm going to express now, are mine, and not Ember-Riddle Aeronautical University. So if you disagree with me, with, with them, please don't disagree with my colleagues at Ember-Riddle. Uh, disagree with me. Uh, I'm going to try and do this as quickly as I can. I know we're running out of time. What what I want to really cover is the role of universities, plural, within our industry, which I've been very engaged in for the past 31 years as a senior academic in aviation, university aviation, and at the same time thread through the role of universities in delivering aviation competencies particularly next generation aviation competencies through university bachelors, masters, PhD degrees, and research. So what I want to do is while I'm, while I'm talking, please read my text very quickly. This is going to be speed reading because I'm not going to go through the, the, the slides uh, in order to try and keep within the seven minutes. Oops. In terms of the... Of, of, if you like, the, the major industry role, I think in aviation, in ICAO, uh, I certainly have been involved, and I think uh, universities tend to have a little bit of involvement in Annex 1, Annex 2, Annex 6, 11, 13, and 17. To me, each of those annexes have major research issues which aren't or have not necessarily been uh, addressed. And I want to make one little digression, I'll try and do it within 60 seconds, but um, many of you will be very familiar with the multi-crew pilot license, the MPL. And I was very privileged to be involved in that process um, really as a result of some major research uh, and uh, development of an of a, uh, academic program which in, in a way was a thread to what became the MPL. 
But the point that I want to make is, after initial ad hoc, as we call it, ad hoc meetings in Madrid and so on, uh, ICAO agreed to set up a panel, the flight crew licensing uh, and training panel, and in Montreal, and I got very ex excited about going along to it. And I can remember bringing a, a colleague of mine uh, in Montreal and said, I will see you next week. To which the response was, no, you can't. I said, what do you mean, no, you can't? You have seen the work that, I, that I've been doing, the research programs and so on, the activities, um, and in, in a way, in terms of what we talked about and have been talking about, it's a thread in what might become a new license. And the person said, yeah, yeah, no, I agree with all of that. But you can't come because we don't recognize universities. You are not an, an accredited, universities are not accredited observers, so you can't come. So being reasonably creative, I rang a colleague of mine in Australia, in the, at CASA, and said, can I be an Australian and a member of CASA for a few weeks, because I want to go to Montreal. And the person said, yeah, 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 come along, no, no, no problem at all. So uh, there I was. To this very day, as far as I'm aware, universities are not uh, accredited observers. Now I think the session after this panel is really potentially a high point in terms of the creation of Al uh, uh, Alicanto and an opportunity for universities firstly to work together because universities tend to find working together difficult, but to work together on some of those issues that I've just identified in terms of ICAO, some of those annexes which progressively are changed, are modified, or new annexes are proposed, the, 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 the observers that we have at the Air Navigation Commission, very important, but I think there's need for a university and a research input as well. Uh, so that's a, a critical part of, uh, of what I'm on about. Um, this was a comment that was made at a conference that I uh, attended in, uh, in Delhi uh, in uh, 2016. I think the minister, Mr. Ashok Raju, was absolutely right, and this statement could apply, I think, across the world. Absolutely correct. I'm not going to spend any time here. I think we all know the figures, they vary slightly, so I'm just going to say, obviously, demand for new pilots, huge. Demand for mechanics and maintenance engineers, huge, and particularly Asia. Um, what about the other sectors? And we don't get to hear so much about it, but uh, I once upon a time had a degree program exclusively focused on cabin crew and the role of cabin crew in terms of technical skills and where cabin crew career-wise might go after they finish actually flying for an airline. Um, it was um, a very successful program. But you know, how many cabin crew? do we need in the future? What about airport managers and administrators? And I know in China, the growth of brand new airports, astronomical. How do we ensure that we design and develop the human resources, the human infrastructure in ways which are uh, 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 appropriate and data driven? Airport security, cyber, uh, cyber security issues, uh, a, a rapidly growing topic which I'm very passionate about as well. Customer services and so on. My figure, and it's just my figure, maybe three million people, but I, I don't know, it could be, it could be anything. Um, so where are we currently? Have a quick glance at those items on that slide. What are we currently doing? Scan down that, three seconds. 
and we certainly need a more flexible and professional workforce. I have a definition there of where we should, of, of, of the kind of things that we should be doing. This is obviously for in pilot training, something that I'm very involved in. Are we really producing professionals? We call ourselves profession, professionals, but do we have, is there such a thing called an aviation profession? I think it's debatable as to whether there is. And in terms of next generation aviation professionals, they need to be uh, entering into a profession. Okay, so I, I, w I work with NGAP finally. Um, we need to be developing in our curricula appropriate uh, STEM related content. Applying instructional design, uh, design science, and some universities are doing this extremely well. Um, agreeing on validating competencies, and I have to say we have very little validation data. That's a problem. We need to be actually data driven. Uh, looking at new approaches to the kind of competencies that we need to measure, MPL, multi-crew, but we don't measure it in a multi-crew way. This is a global industry. Universities need to work globally to achieve those outcomes. And so I think that's my last slide. I hope you've scanned it as quickly as I've been flicking them. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hunt. Some very serious points, uh, very well said. Next up, we welcome Ms. Katie Pribble, who will discuss IOPA's work in attracting young people to aviation careers. Ms. Pribble holds a degree in aeronautical science from Embry Riddle Aeronautical University and flew as a professional pilot for regional airlines and sharing her passion for aviation at the US FAA's National Aviation Safety Data Analysis Center, then as Director of Communications with the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, before joining the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, where she is currently serving as Senior Vice President, Aviation Strategy and Programs. Ms. Pribble, you have the floor, ma'am. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Hurley. It's a pleasure to be speaking here and invited to the Global Summit, and I'd like to congratulate Dr. Liu and her ICAO staff on a really successful event. Uh, I am proud to be representing the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Since 1939, AOPA has been protecting the freedom to fly for thousands of aircraft uh, owners, pilots, and aviation enthusiasts. AOPA is the world's largest association of pilots. The International Council of uh, AOPA, IAOPA, represents over 400,000 pilots from 79 countries. And again, we thank you for inviting AOPA and IOPA to uh, be a part of this global summit. I think it's been well established over the past couple days that the demand for uh, manned and unmanned pilots is as high as we've ever seen and that uh, bodes well for students. There's a lot of future opportunities for our young people in aviation. By our estimation, there has never been a better time for young people to pursue a career in aviation and aerospace. And again, we've seen the numbers uh, several times here. We don't need to go over those again. We need a lot of pilots and a lot of maintenance technicians, air traffic controllers, and others. So the demand is, is well defined. I don't think there's a debate as to whether or not we have uh, some workforce challenges ahead of us. The question is, what are we doing about it? And that's the focus of this panel. What strategies and innovations uh, are we doing to, we, to meet our future workforce challenges? So at AOPA, when we looked at this challenge, we didn't believe there was a silver bullet or one single program or initiative that was going to help us solve these challenges of inviting new people and helping young people discover aviation, improving the experience that people have when they're learning to fly, and finally keeping the pilots in our community active and engaged. 
So we created a program called You Can Fly. Under You Can Fly, we have four initiatives that are designed to provide resources and assistance to pilots wherever they may need us throughout their life cycle. Our high school initiative, which I'm going to focus on today, uh, helps young people discover aviation. Our flight training initiative is designed to improve the experience that people have when they learn to fly, so we create more pilots. You may be surprised to learn that 70 to 80 percent of, of pilots or people in America who start flight training don't finish with a certificate, 70 to 80 percent. They may take a discovery flight, they may solo, they may, be, may even uh, finish a portion of their cross-country requirements and they don't finish with a license. So our flight training initiative is aimed to make that experience a better one, one that is more successful and creates more pilots. Our Flying Clubs initiative is designed to help pilots stay in the game. So many pilots, when they get their license, don't have the ability to own their own airplane or rent. Our Flying Clubs initiatives allows people to uh, join together to buy an airplane, share the costs, and have a lot of fun doing it. And I'm proud to say that as of last week, AOPA has helped start our 100th Flying Club. And then finally, uh, the last initiative of You Can Fly is our Rusty Pilots program. There's hundreds of thousands of Rusty Pilots, LAPS Pilots uh, around, and this program helps them uh, meet the requirements and get back into the left seat. So we've far we've had over 6,000 pilots complete our Rusty Pilots program and uh, gotten current again. <laughs> So as I mentioned, we want to I want to focus today on our high school initiative, which is aimed at putting uh, aviation education in front of high school students in their classrooms on a daily basis. And we're doing that primarily through the curriculum that we are building and deploying across uh, the country. I'll talk about that in more detail. We're also providing scholarships to students. And finally, we're providing opportunities for educators and administrators to learn how to start and build aviation programs in their high schools. So let's start with our curriculum. Like I mentioned, we are introducing young people to aviation and aerospace careers through a four-year STEM-based aviation curriculum. We are building this curriculum along two different pathways, flying and UAS or, or drones. We're building this curriculum and through donations to the AOPA Foundation, we are offering this free to any high school who wants it. That's public schools, private schools, or charter schools. Many of the schools that are using our curriculum today are using it in career and technical education programs. A hallmark of career and technical education is that students come away after their studies with an industry credential. So uh, after the third year of students who are in the flying program, they will be prepared to take their FA uh, private pilot written exam. For those in the drone or UAS program, they're prepared after their third year to take the part FA part 107 commercial pilot drone exam. We knew that when we built this curriculum, if it didn't include everything, it might not be used or deployed in the manner that we had hoped. So we're building this curriculum and it's incredibly comprehensive. It has everything a teacher or school could need to, uh, to teach aviation to students. We have lesson plans for every single day of instruction. It includes presentations for the lectures and to communicate and teach the information to students. It has a lot of hands-on activities and student projects teaching aids, simulation scenarios. Many of our schools have simulators uh, in their classrooms or in their schools or have access to them. And finally, we even provide the assessments and the exams. Everything is provided to the teacher. I'm proud to say that uh, our ninth grade curriculum, our first year of curriculum, is in over 80 schools uh, across the United States. Uh, each year we uh, build a year of curriculum and we test it in a small subset of schools. We take the evaluation, we take the teacher and the student feedback, we roll that back in and offer it, as I mentioned, free to any high school. So last year we field tested our ninth grade, our first year of curriculum, and that's uh, the curriculum that's in over 80 schools across the country and currently we're field testing our 10th grade curriculum. Each year we'll field test and then deploy another year until we have all four years complete. One of the things that's really important to AOPA uh, and our curriculum is to make sure we get data and we know that the resources and the time and effort that we're spending is moving the needle and making a difference. So we collect a lot of data, data and do a lot of surveys. I'm really proud to say that 25% of our students are female. 
uh, and as compared to the single digit numbers of females currently around pilots around the world, we are very excited by this figure. In addition, 51% of our students uh, are from underrepresented uh, demographics. That's another exciting figure and, um, that we are very pleased and encouraged with. Uh, I should also say that uh, in our ninth and 10th grade classes, we have over 2,500 students currently taking and, and utilizing this curriculum. So a lot going on. The exciting part is that we've had an incredible response from schools. In fact, uh, we have more schools than, than we can handle at the moment, which is a really fantastic problem to have. Uh, marketing and getting the word out about this curriculum has not been the problem. The biggest uh, challenge and the hardest part of this is, is actually building it. I mentioned that we also host uh, events, opportunity to call it Teach the Teacher, uh, giving students or educators the opportunity to learn about how they can build programs in their schools. Uh, just last month, we had our fourth AOPA High School Aviation STEM Symposium. There's a lot of STEM symposiums around the, the country. This is the only one focused solely on aviation. We held it in Louisville, Kentucky in partnership with UPS Cargo Airlines. Many of our attendees had an opportunity uh, to visit Worldport, tour the maintenance facilities and also fly the simulators. In addition, we had wonderful keynote speakers including Gwen Shotwell, the president and COO of SpaceX, a company that is in the news a lot lately about the commercial space. Uh, and finally, our teachers had an opportunity to uh, share best practices and network and learn from one another um, on how to incorporate aviation into their classrooms and how to incorporate AOPA's curriculum into their classrooms. Next year, our symposium will begin be held in November in Denver, Colorado, United Airlines Flight Training Center. And finally, uh, scholarships. Uh, over the past couple of years, we have given $100,000 worth of scholarships to high school students. Um, and when I built these slides, I couldn't um, put in there the, a special announcement. We just announced that next year, through a very generous donor, we will be offering $1 million worth of flight training scholarships to students and teachers. The first time uh, next year we'll be offering scholarships to teachers, we'll be giving 100 different scholarships away at $10,000 each. So we're really excited about um, the, the momentum that the high school uh, initiative has built. We're excited about the response we're getting and we really look forward to continuing our work with IKO and industry to introduce more young people to aviation and aerospace careers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pribble. An excellent presentation. And I think we only have time for one question, realizing that we have a tight agenda right after this as well. But if you'll allow um, uh, the chance for all speakers to express perhaps for a minute or less on this question, that'd be great to have a bit of a conversation. So the question is, if we are successful in the goals expressed this week, and we do achieve in attracting a large number of next generation of aviation professionals to aviation, how do we then ensure that the different sectors of aviation aren't competing with each other for those next generation of aviation professionals, whether it's to become a pilot, engineer, manufacturers, or at airports. And with the diverse panel that we have of experts coming from those sectors, uh, I think we can start to address the question, even if only briefly, for a minute or less. And to start us off, perhaps Mr. Rao, if you can express on the, on the uh, view of airports about how do we ensure that we aren't competing with each other for the limited pool of end gaps. Mr. Rao. As you are right, absolutely, there's a competing industries are there. In fact, today, in our uh, airport sector, in our group, 80% of non-aviation people are working in my company, including myself. In 2006, I'm not from the aviation sector at all. So there is a possibility, if you have a proper training, orientation, if we're able to give that, even we can, from other industries, we can bring them to the aviation sector. We not be absolutely from the aviation sector. It's too limited field for us. So that's what we've taken. In fact, uh, we, are, we have pursued that career and proper training and sufficient knowledge base able to support them, I'm sure we can attack from other industries come to aviation industry. That's the only way we can shortcut the present need of this industry instead of waiting for growing from aviation industry itself. 
Thank you, Mr. Al. Perhaps from the point of view of the manufacturers, Ms. Bo, if you can address the question of how do we ensure that we don't compete against each other uh, to attract the best end gaps for our particular sectors. Ms. Bo. Thank you very much. Let me share with you some of my personal thoughts. I think this question is pretty broad, but uh, let me just uh, give you a very simple answer. At the very beginning, you have to cultivate the, someone's passion over this industry, and he will have a sense of the mission, and I think he or she will be devoted to this career. And I can say that for individual or for the company and uh, for the working environment, the teams, these are all the factors that decide someone's uh, commitment to this journey. If you have a sense of the mission, you will love the things you're doing. And from to gain, gain an academic perspective, we'll, we'll split the, the question both to Mr. Professor Huang and Professor Hunt. So Mr. Huang, if you please. There exist a difference between the trading and the education. Of course, the university education should cover more disciplines, arrows, directions. But when the students are graduated from university, they enter the company and the enterprise. In their career development, the training courses are needed. So the best way to, I think, uh, the university should uh, cooperate with the uh, company as well. This is very important. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Wang. Professor Hunt, to complete the academic perspective. Thank you. Um, my only comment is, uh, I've talked about, uh, briefly about professionalism, creating a profession, creating an aviation profession. Uh, the, has to be a core set of competencies that universities agree to. Now, the process of agreeing, maybe that's through organizations such as Alicanto, ICAO, NGAP, you know, it's a partnership to say, here is a set of competencies that students need to achieve and then move on to specializations. But, you know, if, 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 uh, if one focuses on being a pilot, but after 10 years one doesn't want to be a pilot, but one wants to maintain the professional role in the industry, you don't want to start from scratch. You want to have a framework to move on and to, over a lifetime of career, be able to move up sideways or anyway because you have those basic skills. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hunt. Ms. Pribble, to complete our discussion today. Thank you. I, th I think a, a recognition that this is an entire industry problem, not a single sector. So it's, this is not just an airline problem or a business aviation problem or a general aviation challenge. This, this workforce, these workforce challenges really belong to the entire aviation industry. And uh, we've seen recognition of that through our high school uh, initiative. I think the airlines are realizing that, especially in the United States, the military is producing fewer pilots and the airlines and business aviation and others are going to continue to rely on general, general aviation to train the future workforce. And we've seen that uh, American Airlines, UPS, I mentioned United Airlines, all of them are providing resources to us and funding because they recognize general aviation's important role. We also recognize that as we deploy this curriculum that many of the students will uh, choose professional aviation, hopefully business aviation as well. We just hope that they continue to stay active and involved as pilots and continue to fly recreational and be involved in general aviation as well. Uh, general aviation, business aviation, the airlines, it's, they're all part of a really big aviation ecosystem. We need all sectors to be strong, and I think there's a recognition of that, and there continues to be recognition of that. Thank you, Ms. Pribble. As you can see by um, the presentations today, as well as the uh, engagement on this uh, one question that we've had time to address today, there is, we are only touching the surface, and there's lots more we need to hear from you about how do we build this uh, aviation future together. So we encourage you to continue the discussion with our panel members, with myself, with each other during the breaks and the margin of this and in, in the weeks and months to come. But to uh, end the session, because I realize we're, we're tight on time, please join me in a large round of applause for our panel members today.
thank you very much, Claude, and all moderators, and another big round of applause for the, the, this panel. Thank you very much. And now uh, we will uh, uh, have uh, the opportunity to witness uh, the introduction of the International Association of Aviation and Aerospace Education. And uh, Ms. Angela Abiltron and Ms. Pascal, Mr. Pascal Revel uh, will make an important announcement regarding uh, this uh, international network of uh, aviation uh, universities. So please uh, welcome them on stage. Thank you very much for the kind invitation by ICAO. Uh, we're very pleased to, uh, to announce the, uh, the creation of the first Global International Association of Aviation Aerospace Education called Alicanto. The slide here um, are the universities that worked together over the last few months to create the organization to set the foundation. And what is important in this slide um, are not just the names of the universities, which many of you will recognize, the elite universities, Beihang University, my university, Embry-Riddle, Moscow State University of uh, Aviation, McGill, Enak and the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. But what is important for you in this slide is that we are all from different regions. We have Russia, the United States, China, South Africa, Canada, and France represented. And we all work together very closely to make this happen. So again, this is, I think, um, something that, that we really want to make sure that uh, we, uh, we recognize. So why is there a need for a global network of aviation and aerospace industries? Um, and I believe you've already heard this morning uh, in, in some of our um, uh, previous presenters that there is a need uh, regionally that's been identified to help improve the mutual recognition of higher education diplomas because we do know that the graduates uh, are mobile. They're, they may have a degree that they receive in the United States and then they come to China and work. So we want to make sure that we, uh, we improve the mutual recognition of diplomas. We increase the mobility of students and faculty to acquire a more international dimension in teaching and learning. Cooperate with multinational companies to better tailor our programs to your needs. And to represent and voice the interests of the academic community to national, supranational authorities, work on future standards, programs, and improve participation to seek research funding. So with the continued globalization and the growth, particularly in aviation transportation, there really was a need to work together on a global level. Furthermore, last year at ICAO and GAP, um, the creation of a consortium was advocated uh, and, um, and it was recognized the need to collaboratively develop initiatives to attract and prepare the next generation of aviation professionals. My last two slides before I um, uh, give it to my colleague from ENAC uh, are our mission, our vision, and our objectives. Our mission, uh, again, is to be a global advocate for aviation education and represent, promote, and support the interests of our members. Our vision is that we will sh strive to address aviation education and research issues, both current and for the future, as well as synthesize widely consensual positions reflecting our members' views on those issues at the global level. The objectives of our organization are to represent and establish cooperation with various stakeholders, as well as with governments and international organizations. We want to assist our members in the development of strategies and actions for attracting and educating the next generation of aviation professionals. 
We want to support our members in the development of educational and research programs that prepare students for aviation careers in a sustainable global society. We strive to maximize cooperation, mutual assistance among higher educational institutions around the globe. We want to advance the development of aviation education and the associated programs by enhancing public awareness of the economic and social importance of civil aviation. We want to create a forum where academics, students, regulators, and industry worldwide can meet, discuss, exchange ideas, and identify and conduct aviation research surrounding educational issues and advances in the field of aviation education. And then, as we heard this morning, importantly, we want to promote gender equality in aviation, support sustainable development. I will continue. Good morning, everybody. Um, Alicanto has been uh, incorporated recently as a non-profit uh, association in Montreal, Canada, and as such, Alicanto structure has to comply with Canadian law and regulations. So once we have enough members, we, our plan is to uh, have a general assembly uh, which will elect a board of directors each of them being responsible for a standing committee. At this stage, we have many ideas about the possibilities for standing committees, but uh, important areas include aviation research, science and technology, uh, aviation aerospace education, and aviation stakeholders relations, which is also an important one because it includes the relationship with uh, ICAO and industrial companies and others like communications, public relations, finances, and membership. This one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Membership. I'll give it to you. Alicanto sees itself as a non-sectarian, non-partisan, and non-profit organization. Membership is voluntary and it relies on the commitment of members to participate in Alicanto's activities, which includes at least one general meeting of members per year. So our main idea for membership is that uh, voting membership is available to higher education institutions that award at least one higher education diploma in aviation or aerospace related disciplines. Why become an Alicanto member? Well, Alicanto helps your organization stay informed about global developments in aviation and education, that is, learn about future needs of aviation employers so that your organization can evolve your educational programs. Another reason for it is being part of Alicanto ensures that your interests are represented and taken into account at the global level. Finally, with Alicanto, your organization becomes an active player on global aviation issues and can interact with international stakeholders such as ICAO and other associations like IATA, ACI and others. Membership shall not require significant resources. Signing a letter of intent, that's for today. Demonstrate your willingness to commit and support activities. We'll have a small institutional membership fee and we expect members to attend the annual conference. So what's next for 2019? Expanding our membership is the first priority. We also want to develop a strategic plan. And we also have a website which is currently under construction and should be available very soon, early in 2019. So we, we can answer questions, it will be available for this right after the signing ceremony, I guess, and there is also um, an email here, well, it's all gone already. Signing ceremony is, uh, well, for now, during the signing ceremony, institutions who will be signing the letter of intent express their willingness to become a member, acknowledging the importance of ICAO's NGAP program to bring together states, educational and training institutions, United Nations organizations, industry, and other actors to address existing and future aviation personnel shortages. 
recognizing that university participation and input is critical in order to identify and implement effective approaches to attract, educate, and retain the next generation of aviation professionals, and stating that your organization is conscious of the need to have an international organization that would serve as a global advocate for aviation universities to represent, promote, and support the interests of its members. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Angela and Pascal. And now it's my great pleasure to, to invite the universities uh, and uh, the supporting uh, institution organizing uh, organization attending uh, the signing ceremony to line up uh, on, my, uh, on the stage on my left. And we will call for the signature for each of uh, the universities and supporting organization. Uh, I just want to, to, to mention that we have a part of the, the organization and university that will sign today. We have more than 80 universities that express their support for this. Unfortunately, they weren't able to, to come. There are many more logos than you see on the scene. It's just a compendium of what we have. But uh, uh, there is a big support and uh, uh, willingness to, to be part of this initiative, and I want to thank them all, even if they are not present uh, today. So um, we wait for the preparation. Nacional de la Aviación. We will call you. <laughs> And I will start with the uh, Ecole Nationale d'Aviation Civile. Pascal? Pascal? Tatiana? Tatiana, please join us. Uh, we'll start with Ecole Nationale de l'Aviation Civile. Pascal. I need someone next to them to show them what they could sign. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. University. Yeah. With University, Northwest Johannesburg, University. South Africa. Aeronautical University, United States. <laughs> Moscow State Technical University of Civil Aviation. Congratulations.
Northwestern Polytechnical University. Here, here, here. Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Cappadocia Universities, Turkey. Shenyang Aerospace University. Shenzhen MSUBIT University. Thank you, sir. National University of Transportation. Tongji University. Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Chongqing Jiao Tong University. Central South University. North University of China. Jilin University. Ben. 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 
North China Institute of Aerospace Engineering. Università Telematica Giustino Fortunato. Harbin Engineering University. Institute of Technology. University of Technology. Zhengzhou University of Aeronautics. University. Xihua University. I gave them free notice. 请北京理工大学做准备。Beijing Institute of Technology. Singapore. Singapore Institute of Technology. University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. Thank you. National Aviation University, Kiev, Ukraine. Guang 
州民航职业技术学院做准备。Guangzhou Civil Aviation College, Georgia. Sir. Samara National Research University. Go to to see what Tatiana wants. Go to see what Tatiana wants. Okay. Go to check what Tatiana wants. Georgian Aviation University. University of Aerospace Technology. Guilin Li Gong Society. This is now. Yes. Xi'an Jiao Da, do prepare. Xi'an Jiao Tong University. There. We missed one. And Samara National Research University from Russian Federation. Which one? We missed one. Which one? Uh, no. Zhengzhou University of uh, Zhengzhou, uni uh, Zhengzhou University of Aeronautics. Yes, this one. I, I said. Yes. Say. But he's still there. Okay. okay. Zhengzhou University of Aeronautics. Zhengzhou Hangkong Guye Guanli Xue Yuan. And also the supporting organization. The Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics. The Aerospace College Alliance of Sina Universities, ARCAS. Partnership of European Group of Aeronautics and Space Universities, Pegasus. Directorate General of Civil Aviation, Turkey. Romanian Aeronautical Association, European Aviation Institute. University of Turkish Aeronautical Association. We miss one university. Chungsan University. 
Ms. Jarong Yang, Mr. Aaron Mishra, Mr. James Wang, Mr. Henry Gurji, Dr. Michelle Miller, and Dr. Tatiana Pak to join us for the group photo.